Welcome everyone. In this upcoming lecture, Dr. David B. Levy will speak about five 20th century scholar librarians, Moritz Steinschneider, Alexander Marx, Umberto Casuto, Gershom Shalom, and Chaim Arya Vilsker. In the interest of time, Dr. Levy will not speak to us about some other great scholar librarians, such as Abraham Berliner, Abraham Freydes, Jacob Dinstag, Rabbi Ephraim Oshri, Chaim Maccabee, Stefan Reif, Malachi Beit Aryeh, and Menachem Schmelzer. These scholar librarians should serve as insp inspiring models to Judaica librarians for the proper integration and fusion of scholarship with practicing Judaica librarianship. These extraordinary scholarly librarians' research gave mission, guidance, and purpose to their being great Judaica librarians. These scholar librarians show us that there is no substitute for authentic subject knowledge seeing backstretch interdisciplinary connections and wide reading background and autodidactism that allows one to cast a wide cognitive net in familiarization with a broad range of Judaica subjects, disciplines, and methods that benefits the field of Judaica librarianship. Until Judaica librarianship again values the importance of Jewish scholarship as an essential key component working in tandem with serving as a Judaica librarian, the profession will be less for this myopic lack of vision. The understanding of these scholarly librarians shines as a beacon parad paradigm for weathering the fashions of ephemeral techno technological changes that morph into the trunk type of professional librarian specialist technocrats. Because these scholar librarians know the substantial content of books, manuscripts, and journals in their collections, etc., rather than technocrats proficient in merely accessing information, ad captum vulgi, mm. their examples serve as standards by which librarianship should set high the bar. We hope you enjoy the lecture. Thank you so much, Alita Portnoy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, as Alita mentioned, tonight we will be looking at five scholar librarians. And uh, of course, a little uh, light uh, note on the number five. Five is the cup of Eliyahu Anavi at the Pesach Seder. And if you want five people on your basketball team as librarians, so to speak, these are the five librarians you'd want to work with a team if you're doing heavy-duty research. Um, five is a significant number, but Hebaram, the hey, he create, Hashem created the world. Uh, a lot could be said about five. Um, the five pebbles, David HaMelech even, I think uh, it's said in the exoteric text, uh, killed Goliath between the eyes with the zits. Um, of course, we know from the exoteric texts of the commentaries that just as Moshe Rabbeinu killed the taskmaster with the Yud Kei Vav Kei, David HaMelech uh, says to uh, Goliath, you come before me with the uh, shield, uh, spear, and javelin, I come before you with the name, the name of Adoshem Tzvaot. So um, these names are not well known, maybe amongst uh, some of the more from circles, but in the world of librarianship, particularly Judaica librarianship, these are the five people you want on your basketball team uh, in a uh, librarian uh, group. Uh, and, you know, often in librarian work, you know, you might do a reference question, and it really depends on your team to give credit to the whole team. One, the point guard passes the ball off, another one spins around like Michael Jordan, um, but the one who does the slam dunk, it's a team effort. And these librarians um, were really extraordinary in uh, the history of Judaica librarianship, but as a thread from which uh, we uh, drew the lecture on cherishing, revering, and um, loving text, even though most of these librarians uh, 
with the exception, of course, the ones that I'm necessarily not going to be able to focus on, like Rabbi Ephraim Ashri, who was a librarian, or uh, Avram Berliner and, and some of the other ones, Menachem Schmelzer, they were from. Uh, these librarians, even though um, they were a part of the Wissenschaftliche Judenbewegung, or the Science of Judaism uh, movement, uh, they had a love for text, and they revered texts, and they cherished text, even though um, the majority of the movement of Wissenschaftliche Judentum may have not have been from a position of Amuna and Betachon, although there are exceptions of this movement of Wissenschaftliche Judentum Bewegung, which began in uh, Europe, particularly German-speaking lands, in the 1800s uh, up until the Holocaust, there were from practitioners of this method, and those include uh, scholars such as Isaac Heinemann, who were, wrote a work called Gott Dienst in der Talmud, and my, one of my favorite scholars, Julius Preuss, who I have his work in German on the shelves, um, called Biblische Tam, uh, und Talmudische Medicine, uh, which uh, Fred Rosner has translated into English, but I have it in German, and he, those two examples, Isaac Heinemann, his work, Gott Dienst in der Talmud, was uh, translated into Hebrew to Philip of Talmud, um, and Preuss's work has been translated into Hebrew subsequently. Uh, they were Orthodox from practitioners of the Wissenschaft des Judentum. Uh, so we are going to be focusing on um, a limited group of these scholars, tonight, um, and um, I hope you will see that even though these five um, may have been um, not representatives of Haredi Judaism, they had a deep devotion, love, and cherishing and revering of text, uh, and the spark in their souls uh, was ultimately Kiddush Hashem. So let's begin with our first practitioner, Marit Steinschneider, born in Moravia, 1816 to 1907. Uh, often noted as the father of modern Jewish bibliography. He was an Orientalist, a historian, and scholar of medieval Judaica. Uh, he was among the founders of the Science of Judaism movement, Wissenschaftliche Judentum Bewegung. Um, and this movement was um, enabled by, for the first time, Jews were allowed to go to secular universities. There had been quota of token Jews in the Middle Ages, uh, particularly David Ruderman has noted that Jews... Um, went to medical school in greater mass in the Renaissance in Italy, and they, of course, came with their Hebrew and Aramaic from their cheder and yeshiva environment, and then they were allowed to go to medical school where they were required to learn Latin and Greek in the Renaissance of Italy. Um, and it's true, in Montpellier you did have a medieval uh, medical school where Jews were admitted in, in relatively larger numbers than elsewhere, um, but it's really with this Enlightenment and Emancipation um, post-French Revolution and Bismarck who gave certain rights to Jews, that Jews could go to university. And in university they learned cognate Semitic languages. They learned, for instance, Akkadian, like the word rakia in Akkadian means copper beaten gnome. So we see a cognate idea when in the beginning of Breshit the word rakia is, is employed uh, to mean firmament. Um, uh, you know, from the Akkadian perspective, their deity, a pagan deity, just put a little copper beaten dome on top of uh, the earth and so forth. But um, these scholars, uh, who I'm going to be focusing along, along with all the business of Jujundum, the Vagon scholars, were required to know Latin, Greek, Attic and Coin Greek, um, Chaldean, um, and um, Syriac, uh, which the Peshitta is written, and certainly medieval Arabic, and I'm going to speak about Steinschneider, knew Arabic very well, and really his works are a benchmark and tour de force still to this day on medieval uh, Jewish philosophy that was written largely in Hebrew characters, but in Arabic. Um, and then they knew, you know, maybe 10 modern languages as well. So these were the standards of the European University at the time that Jews, um, for a certain moment in history, were admitted to these universities in larger numbers. And of course they were trained in Hebrew and Aramaic from the Cheder and Yeshiva, and then they went to the university and learned all these ancient languages and modern languages. And they forged a new type of scholarship that was an amalgam of traditional Jewish learning and the new methods and strategies and uh, techniques of modern scholarship. So Steinschneider, um, he wrote as reflected in the work Die Zukunft der Jüdischen 
Wissenschaft in 1869, uh, this new movement began half a century after Zunz has issued his programmatic statement on, quote, etwas über die rabbinische Literatur. Um, unlike other 19th century Jewish scholars of the Wissenschaftliche Judenbewegung initiated by Emanuel Wolf and made great by Zunz and Geiger, Steinschneider's work was not limited to subjects with a direct Jewish connection. Uh, he was familiar with almost everything that had been written about pre-modern science, philosophy, medicine. Dr. Charles Manikin, in his essay, Marge Steinschneider's Indecent Burial, does detective sleuthing to uncover how it is unfair to characterize that it is reportedly said by Gershom Scholem, a great Zionist scholar who pioneered the field of academic study of uh, Jewish mysticism, in his criticism of Wissenschaft in Mitoch Hir Horim al Hokmat Yisrael in Devarim Bego, published first in Luach Haaretz, later reissued in Wissenschaft von Judentum einst und jetzt in Zur Geschichte der Juden in Deutschland, and later published in Hokmat Yisrael the Yachdut, reprinted in Ode Devar. Um, in reality, Sholem had referred to uh, Steinschneider in his work Me Berlin Le Yerushalayim, written first in German, which confesses his admiration for Steinschneider and Zunz and the Wissenschaft der Juden und Wegum. But this sort of bad PR that Scholem uh, was critical of Wissenschaft, um, according to Dr. Manikin, is not exactly factual. Unfactually, Scholem ended up inadvertently framing Steinschneider in his diatribe against Wissenschaft, which was published in 1945, as cold and antiquarian. Um, and in that um, mischaracterature, because Scholem really had admiration for Steinschneider, uh, Steinschneider is most quoted, misquoted, as saying, Wir haben nur noch die Aufgabe, die Überrest des Judentum ehren wohl zu bestatten. And uh, I would translate that, the task of Jewish studies is to provide the remnants of Judaism a decent burial. So this is a misquote. Steinschneider really never really said exactly. As for Steinschneider's alleged comment that it is the task of scholars to provide the remnants of Judaism with a decent burial, uh, it's not found among Steinschneider's writings, but was attributed to him in a necrology published by the German Zionist periodical Jüdische Rundschau by the Orientalist Gotthold Weil, who had been Steinschneider's student and participated in the short-lived Zionist National Jüdische Verein der Horror an der Lehrenstadt für die Wissenschaft des Judentums in Berlin. So um, Steinschneider got bad PR, um, and um, the clue to uh, detectively sleuthing this puzzle of how he's misquoted, um, we must understand this alleged comment by Steinschneider in the light of the great Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, who was the founder of Neo-Orthodoxy, which later led to modern orthodoxy. As I'd mentioned in previous lectures, Hirsch um, in Frankfurt am Main uh, founded uh, a movement of Neo-Orthodoxy that would allow Jews to remain traditional and yet live in the modern world. Haredi Judaism, or ultra-Orthodox Judaism, uh, is very proud and content to live in the medieval world. Um, they uh, want minimal interaction with the outside world. But Hirsch was going to bring the beauty of Yafet into the tents of Shem, and that meant also uh, being open to the beautiful poetry and significantly thought of Goethe, who wrote works also in science on color theory and so forth. Um, but particularly Hirsch and later modern orthodoxy in the formulation of uh, Torah im Derech Eretz meant that Jews could learn science and have a worldly profession as scientists and physicians and so forth, as well as be orthodox Jews. And um, he was also very Zionistic, as many more ultra-Orthodox Jews were not. Hirsch was a Zionist. Um, he in, in, in innovated and made certain other more minor reforms, uh, such as um, sermons in German, which you find in the Frankfurt on the Hudson, which is the Breuer's community. Uh, sermons were given in German up there in uh, the north part of Manhattan, where the German Yekis live. 
And um, he also uh, instituted a choir for the synagogue. No musical instruments, you know, because that would be against the halacha, but you could have men singing on Shabbos uh, to beautify the service. And he also instituted uh, rabbinical robes uh, for the uh, neo-Orthodox rabbis to wear. Um, there's a great article by Dr. Um, Judith Bleich on uh, the clothing uh, that rabbis have worn over the millennium. And particularly during this period when uh, you have neo-Orthodoxy, uh, you know, um, adopting a more modern dress. It says, however, in Mitzrayim, the Jews were redeemed from Egypt because they didn't change the language. Hirsch was a big one for not forgetting Hebrew. He wanted every Jew to be literate. Um, and, he was, and it says in the, in, about Mitzrayim, the Jews did not change their names, and they did not change their dress. In fairness to Hirsch, the dress was only for the rabbis on uh, the bima, so to speak, in these kind of uh, uh, black robes, which were very academic. Um, so to return to this misquote uh, attributed to Steinschneider, uh, Marit Steinschneider, uh, it really stems from Shimshon Raphael Hirsch. That's why I mention it. Um, Hirsch wrote that the scholars of the Wissenschaft keep alive the memory of, quote, old Judaism as it is carried to its grave. Hirsch called Wissenschaft, quote, the fine dust wafting from the stone coffins of moldering uh, past harvests. So Steinschneider, as a master of ironic retort, was saying to a student, Weil, who misquotes him, quote, just as Hirsch and the Orthodox have said, we are burial societies for Jewish culture, let us at least make sure that the burial is an honorable one. And that's a major halachic principle. So you have this uh, Steinschneider that wants to give a good, um, you know, uh, resting place for Jewish culture. That was later um, enacted by Salo Baron in Social and Religious History of the Jews, who opposed Yitzhak Baer's theory of the lachrymose um, aspects of uh, history. It does seem pretty lachrymose. There's a lot of persecution, catastrophe, suffering, and terrible atrocities that happened to Jews uh, for the last two millennium, particularly. Um, in fact, that was the subject of theodicy of my dissertation. But Salo Baron and Steinschneider they wanted to celebrate the cultural and scientific and, um, you know, political achievements of the Jews throughout the last two millennium in the diaspora, and they wanted to, quote, give it a good, good place in the memory of uh, the world and in, uh, to make every Jew aware of this proud history of the contribution of Jews to civilization. Um, but um, in reference to Hirsch, he referred, uh, you know, to the Wissenschaft des Judentum as, you know, these, uh, these, these burial societies of Jewish culture. Um, many of Steinsteiner's students later became prominent Jewish scholars, including Ignaz Goldzeher, Aaron Freeman, Solomon Schechter, Isaac Markon, Chaim Brody. Well, Chaim Brody, I could talk for ages about, and Judas Magnus. I could talk for ages about Judah Magnus. Judah Magnus uh, was a great Zionist and involved in the founding of uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, etc. There's a biography on him that you might want to read. H. Malter, wow, he wrote a great book on Rav Sajagon. Alexander Marx, who will be included in this lecture as a great librarian, who took his cues from his role model of Marit Steinschneider, according to Menachem Schmelzer. And then, of course, other scholars like Arthur Biram and George A. Kahut. There was a whole lecture given on Kahut at a recent Association of Jewish Libraries conference. A lot can be said about Kahut. Samuel Poznanski, who I um, highlighted in my lecture about censorship of Jewish books from the Renaissance to the Nazis. He was a rabbi who uh, built up a really nice, wonderful library with rare books and also a big collection. And um, unfortunately, the Nazis torched his collection. And uh, when Alexander Marx found out about it, um, uh, according to the reports, uh, Marx was in, it wept. Um, and then other non-Jewish scholars of Steinschneider included H.L. Strack, who wrote on Introduction to the Talmud and many other things. Um, Rebecca Kahut refers to Marx's students as Steinschneider's Lieblingsschüler, that is, beloved students. 
uh, Talmidin. Steinsteiner published so many books and journals that if they were to be stacked up, uh, they would be taller than maybe 10 feet high. Um, and there'll be too many for us to list here. Uh, let us note, however, a few of them. The journal Hamizkir, Hebraisha Bibliography, Blata Fua Nua, and Alter Literatur des Judentum, which uh, existed 1858 to 65, 1869 to 81, um, to which he contributed more than 500 articles, tr prolific output concerning bibliography, library history, book lore, philology, cultural history from a Jewish angle. The motto at the top of each issue of this uh, publication is a biblical verse from Yeshayahu 42.9, Harishonot hine ba'u. The Chadashot Ani Magid, Beterem Titzmachana Ashmia Etchem, which I translate, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. So this is a scholar with a mission and a calling to bring hidden things to light in Jewish scholarship, to pioneer new trails as Gershom Sholem as a Zionist would do in Jewish mysticism, this was a uh, one-in-a-billion scholar, Marge Steinschneider. Um, each issue of the journal attempted to give a systematic layout of the year in Jewish scholarship, not just as a scatter of the output or literature, but as a systematic accounting of all articles published or appearing for that particular year. Um, in many ways, Steinschneider was very Germanic um, in his thoroughness and his comprehension and in his diligence in being representative of every source he could find and fish up. And that is a, somewhat of a German trait. Um, and, you know, the Germans are famous for their long titles, uh, you know, like Freud and Hegel, their sentences go on for literally um, sometimes 10, 20 pages. Uh, you, you have that innate to the German language. Like if I want to say the destiny ladenness of language, uh, it would be of uh, the holy, holy scripture language. I might say something to the effect by taking a noun and just making it really, really long. Die Schicksal Langkeit ist die Heilige Schrift. The destiny ladenness of the holy word of Hashem. So uh, Steinschneider, I mentioned, you know, had this Germanic comprehension of a Bildungsgeschichte. And um, he was very thorough in his work. Um, I published on the Wissenschaft in the uh, Judentum Bewegung in more depth in the paper that I gave at um, the Colorado Conference of the AJL on the making of the Jewish Encyclopedia. And to summarize very briefly that long paper of over, I think, 30 or 40, in the original 50 pages, uh, the, the Jewish Encyclopedia represented a culmination or synthesis and precy form of the Wissenschaft des Judentum Bewegung, and it was sponsored. Uh, by um, uh, people in America to sort of like, let's get down, you know, in precy form, some of the fruits of this movement of Wissenschaft des uh before it was destroyed by the Holocaust. Um, some people argue it continues in certain modes of scholarship, but because people don't know German, uh, there are millions of wonderful works on Jewish topics in the German language on university shelves in Europe, particularly in German-speaking lands, lands, Hungary, Austria, and Germany, etc., um, where, you know, um, flora and fauna books, um, every topic under the sun. I just mentioned the two Orthodox Wissenschafts, the Judentum Bewegung scholars, there are more besides Preuss and Isaac Heinemann. Um, so, Steinschneider's scholarship what, uh, in library catalogs was also very thorough. Uh, his unbelievable industry and erudition to catalog and manifest itself in a series of bibliographies is, is breathtaking, among which the most important is his Catalogus Liberum Hebraeum in Bibliotheca Bodiliana from 1852 to 60. You, you better believe uh, he knew Latin very well, and he knew Attic and Koine Greek, and knew medieval Arabic even better. And he, his work in, the, in, in medieval Jewish Arabic uh, philosophy is, is are the benchmarks in the field. Upon the request of Chief Librarian of the Bodleian Library of Oxford, Steinschneider prepared 
a catalog of all printed books up to 1732 in the Bodleian, in you know England. Steinsteiner raised Hebrew bibliography to a scholarly level and corrected misinformation. Steinsteiner also published classic catalogs of the Hebrew manuscript collections of the following libraries, Leiden, 1858, Munich, 1875, and the second enlarged edition, 1896, Hamburg, 1878, reprint with intro by Helmut Braun in 1969, and in Berlin, 1878 to 97. In all of these, he identified many hitherto unknown writings and historical research. And you want to know what else? These were annotated bibliographies often. That means he wrote uh, precy summaries of a paragraph or more about what the works contained. So I remember when I had a job, you know, cataloging Jewish films in a film, Jewish film uh, archive, you know, I, I had a little, little spark of Marge Steinsteiner in me because I said, I've got to watch this Jewish film to do a really good job to catalog it. And in the notes field, I made, you know, annotated remarks about uh, what the film uh, entailed and its plot and its significance for Jewish studies. And they were largely documentary films that had not been cataloged and classified and analyzed in that way. So hopefully my notes fields are still floating around. But more important than that work is the work of Marit Steinschneider. I could go on for ages about his importance. We can only briefly touch on him because we have four more big hitters, you know, basketball players on the team to uh, elaborate. And if you're going for the slam dunk, you better believe that you can do an alley-oop to Marty Steinschneider and he will put that ball in the hoop. And the next librarian, Alexander Marx. I gave a pa I wrote a paper in library science school just on Marx. I think it entailed about 100 pages. I used archival sources. I even took the Amtrak to JTS to look at some of those in the archival boxes and everything you know, file number, folder number, box number. But I'm going to give you just a little synthesis about how important Alexander Marx is for Judaica librarianship and scholarship. Marx was not only a historian and a bibliographer and a librarian, but a man destined in the development of the accruing and acquisition of one of the greatest and largest Judaica and Hebraica collections in the world uh, at JTS in his day. Um, and Steinsteiner's work as the GPS for JTS acquisition policies, making it into a world-renowned resource for Jewish scholarly research. Uh, Menachem Schmelzer writes, uh, who I think is from Hungary, I interviewed him actually on the phone, uh, writes, without Marx's conception of what Yudisha Wissenschaft entailed and what a library that was supposed to serve it should contain, the seminary library would not have become what it did. Schmelzer continues, quote, For Marx, the study of Judaism encompassed, besides rabbinical sources, the history of science, philosophy, medicine, mathematics, practiced by Jews, mainly in the Middle Ages and later, um, and how the Jews Hebraicized these fields. These were subjects of Steinsteiner's many studies. This is interdisciplinary studies before that became all the, the trend recently which is due to really economic factors of budget cuts. You know, so you have a Jewish studies department that's been liquidated because they don't have money to fund them. Jewish studies took off in America in the 1960s, as Jacob Neuser notes in one of his books, as, you know, ethnic studies. You had African-American studies. You had uh, Ladino studies, uh, Hispanic studies, and, and, and feminist studies and so forth. So Jewish studies really takes off in the 60s, but before then, you had, you know, for instance, Harry Austin Wolfson at Harvard, the first professor of Jewish philosophy. After him, you had Rabbi Isidore Tversky. So there were um, aspects of Jewish studies before the 60s, as Neusner seems to harp on. Um, but I mention this because, um, you know, uh, Marit Steinschneider really led to a renaissance, and there was nothing outside of his ken that he did not want to document and preserve and store up as a memory of the Jewish people. So if there were Jewish mathematicians, Steinschneider would read their works in mathematics. I mean, he was, he was adept at scientific works. This was a polymath. You know, this Steinschneider was incredible. Anyway, uh, Menachem Schmelzer goes on. For Marx, the study of Judaism encompasses, besides rabbinical sources, the history of science, philosophy, medicine, and mathematics, and all the sciences in the Middle Ages. These subjects were 
the study of Steinschneider's many uh, scholarly works, and Marx was deeply influenced by them. Cultural and intellectual contacts between Jews, Christians, and Muslims and others were at the center of Steinschneider's interest. The study of mutual influences and translations from one culture into another became significant aspects of Wissenschaftliche Judentum. So I want to also mention Mark, uh, Marit Steinschneider never really earned very much. He was very poor. Um, he actually had to sell off parts of his library to like buy potatoes at one point. Um, so I mention this uh, because, you know, with today with budget cuts and, and departments are having to go to interdisciplinary studies. So you have a Jewish studies professor that also has to teach comparative religion or um, other related allied uh, disciplines and topics related to Jewish studies. Um, Marit Steinschneider did this all pro bonum. He saw the whole net and he wasn't doing it because of budget cuts. He saw that Jewish culture, Jewish life, and the vitality of Jewish scholarship, whether it be in science, math, or whatever field, um, took on a Jewish flavor when Jews were in host cultures and would be, you know, the renaissance that occurred in those places because of a specifically um, learning and education ethic. The study of mutual influences of translations from one culture into another became significant aspects of the Wissenschaftliche Judentum. So I'll mention one work I love very much by Saul Feinsinger. It's a Dickensian universe. You know, like Dickens would get a, a comic laugh out of Feinsinger means somebody who's in the choir. Um, you know, like the Levitical choir in the Beta Macdash. Feinsinger wrote a tour de force article, benchmark study of musical instruments uh, as they're refracted in the Septuagint, the Latin Vulgate, the Septuagint's in Greek, and in the Peshitta in Syriac, in the Tafsir of Rapsajagon in Arabic, and many other modern languages and German translations from, you know, Moses Mendelssohn's Bior, which was written in Hebrew, but in German, in Hebrew characters. And then later Sachs did a translation into German. And uh, the more mo recent modern one in German is Rosenzweig and, and Buber's uh, uh, Die Heilige Schrift in Ihren Verdeutschung. So um, this Stahl Feinsinger knew that a method, which is a Wissenschaft method, to study how the musical instruments changed in the cultural context of the language in which they appeared in those translations from the original source of the Hebrew Tanakh sheds a lot of light on those cultures and the Jews living in those cultures. So I take the word kinor, Hebrew harp. Um, the archaeologists dug up a kinor is in the in the uh, first temple by Rishon is two or three cubits long. In the time of Alexander, uh, three and ten in in ancient quote then called Palestine now Eretz Israel Baruch Hashem. Um, it, it was it was also two or three cubits. But when the Maccabees were followed by the Hasmoneans who invited the Romans in. The word kinor that they dug up in the in the uh, archaeological remains, the detritus of uh, you know Israel uh, in the dirt there, uh, turned up six feet self harp, and so obviously the music of that instrument in the second temple is going to be different in pitch, tone, color, and variation. You're no longer as David Amelech played a little two or three cubit uh, harp uh, in the time of the second temple. You had larger size harps. And um, in Greek transliteration during the time of Alexander, it was transliterated as L-Y-R-E, liar in, in Greek. But the point is that take something like a second temple instrument like the Magri Fa. It appears in the Mishnah, I think in uh, Tamid, in the Mishnah of Tamid, that somebody threw a Magri Fa onto the floor of the Beit HaMikdash and it reverberated. And it relates to a Mishnah about even when the Ketorit was burned, that the goats in the Galilee would sneeze from the Ketorit. The Ketorit, by the way, is a simon or, uh, for um, Osher or wealth. But anyway, be that as it may, um, you, when, they, when somebody threw down this, what sounds like a percussion instrument, um, there, there's speculation in Jewish scholarship that it was shaped like a shovel. Uh, but whatever, it made a big resounding uh, sound when it was thrown down, the Magrefa. 
That's a uniquely Second Temple Juda uh, Judaism uh, temple instrument, which doesn't appear in the First Temple. And people like Marge Steinschneider and the Wissenschaftler Judentum people, scholars would do studies of period instruments. It's one of my niche kind of hobbies. I have three or four bookcases just on Jewish music from the Beit HaMikdash and before um, to the uh, present day in Jewish music. That will be a separate lecture. Um, but we're talking about Alexander March, Marx. He was a student, a Talmud uh, of, of Marit Steinschneider, um, at least in, in uh, Spia, in influence. And certainly this wide net that both of them cast in knowing a lot about a lot rather than a lot about a little, which some critics like Alan Bloom in his Closing of the American Mind argue happened in America when in the 60s um, things became political and you had professors with axes to grind and agendas and that it was more glitzy to be not giving lectures in the classroom or um, the students going to the library to learn something, but, you know, just going to Woodstock and partying and so forth. Um, this kind of nihilism in the music Bloom criticizes. And he argues that um, uh, this Wissenschaft des Judentum Bewegung scholarship uh, really had a wider breadth and broad scope and depth that one rarely finds in the narrow specialization that's required in the humanities today. I remember um, coming across a book that somebody got a PhD just passing an exam in French and they wrote their dissertation on one page of, of Heming, one of Hemingway's uh, little novels. Um, that's great, but there was a time when English literature professors knew from Homer to Joyce, and they were comparative literature professors, and they knew a lot about a lot. Take somebody like Milton. Uh, Milton knew Chaldean, Hebrew, Latin, and many languages, um, modern languages. So Marit Steinscheider, the, the standards were much higher in Europe uh, educational universities. You, you couldn't get a doctorate with knowing, passing only a French exam um, in, in the time of Alexander Marx or the time of uh, Marx Steinscher, Steiner, for short. So let's say a few words about Marx. Marx was born in Elberfeld, Germany, and grew up in Königsberg, East Prussia. Who knows where Königsberg, what's famous for Königsberg? Well, the Beaux-Arts trio, I think the cellist is from Königsberg, but Immanuel Kant was from there. And lo and behold, Hannah Arendt was also from Königsberg. Little, little uh, factoids. So Marx moved to Berlin from Königsberg, where he learned under doctors Abram Ber Abraham Berliner and Marit Steinschneider. We don't have time to touch on Berliner tonight, but he was a traditional from Jew, uh, very religious, and he did such important studies on Rashi that are the benchmark in the field. And he did many other things, but he was a librarian. And uh, I did a whole paper on uh, Abraham Berliner. Much more could be said about his stellar scholarship. And, uh, and Steinschneider uh, also influenced Marx. Um, so Marx studied at the University of Berlin and the Rabiner Seminar in Berlin. And in, he married in 1905 Hannah, the daughter of D. Z. Hoffman. In fact, I remember I bought a book of Hoffman. He wrote in German. Uh, he wrote a wonderful commentary on Vayikra that I have in German. Uh, and he was very prolific and very important. Uh, anyway, um, he was the rector of the seminar in Berlin. Um, in Berlin, Marx was influenced by Marit Steinschneider. Marx visited Solomon Schechter at Cambridge University, and they developed a friendship in their shared love of learning and enthusiasm of Hebrew texts. Um, uh, Marx made a big impression on Schechter. He saw he was a one in a million scholar. And the reason Marx sought out Schechter was because of Marx's research of his dissertation on Seder Olam, a work, uh, you know, somewhat historical work from, in, you know, about two, two, two millennium ago. Schechter was impressed with Marx's wide range of knowledge um, that didn't skimp on depth. Um, in 1903, Marx accepted Schechter's invitation to teach history at the JTS and be its head librarian with a joint appointment to teach. Uh, this is really what you know. So many scholar librarians had that they they were scholars teaching in the in the discipline of uh, Hebrew philology or whatever, as well as running the library. Solomon Goldman, 
According to Goldman, we may say of Marx, as with Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and the Geonim of Rav, um, Shalo Siach Sicha Bitala Kol Yamav, that he never in all his days engaged in idle, useless conversation. There was a, um, a sense about him of never to waste time, Bittal Zaman. Marx was driven by a mission, what Derrida might call archive fever, and he built up one of the most astounding and great collections of Hebraica in the world. Marx also brought to light many obscure and lost texts, contributed to authorship questions, cleared up demographica and statistical approximations, orthographical font identification. The, the Wissenschaft was big on that. Like you had to know how to identify the difference between Rav uh, Yehuda Levi's script of his signature from the Rambam, which would be found in the Cairo Geniza. Marx devoted great attention as well to accurate dating. Um, in women's history, for example, Marx showed that Rashi's daughter Rachel and her husband Eliezer changed their names, calling themselves Bel Aze and Jocelyn, French names. Uh, with regards to Christian Jewish interaction, Marx also made discoveries and brought to light subjects in certain Rashonim. Marx had a way to uncover blind spots and interdisciplinary connections and relate disparate texts. Marx was the quintessential biographer and wrote hundreds of portraits of great rabbis. Marx contributed monographs and articles to journals on a varied variety of subjects. He published two volumes of collected essays, Studies in Jewish History and Book Lore, 26 essays in 44, and Essays on Jewish Biography in 1947. And with Max Margolius, he wrote a history of the Jewish people in 27 that was reissued in 1962. His annual reports of the library's growth, containing a detailed description of materials acquired, were eagerly awaited by bookmen and scholars. 600-page volume under the title of Bibliographical Studies and Notes on Rare Books and Manuscripts in the JTS Library um, characterized, again, that Germanic thoroughness and diligence and comprehensiveness. Marx brought out a first 10 chapters of the critical edition of Seder Olam, part of his dissertation work, and Rabbi Bezazal Ashkenazi's Kelalele HaTalmud, and the textual traditions of Seder Rav Amram Gaon in Jewish, Jewish Quarterly Review. Um, you know, I should say, you know, Alexander Marx, who was brought to JTS by Schechter, Schechter, we have to note, was a librarian too. Uh, and um, Schechter, uh, after Ferkovich, went to the Cairo Geniza, and he brought back steamer trumps uh, to Cambridge University. Um, I think at Oxford you had Adolf Neubauer, who uh, was also a great scholar librarian. But Schechter, you know, brought back these priceless manuscripts and fragments from the Cairo Geniza. Um, I did a PowerPoint and have written on the Cairo Geniza. That will be a separate lecture. But it, there's such a wonderful description of Schechter, and he had these different steamer trunks. And, you know, he would sort them, classification, library and work of, you know, in this, in this steamer trunk, I'm going to take this back to Cambridge, and this has, um, you know, Sifrei Halacha, and this has Shas, and this has Shalot B'Tishuvot, and this has Agata collections, and this has letters, uh, Igarot, and uh, then, of course, these are, this is a steamer trunk of Mishnayas, and these are a steamer trunk of, like, you know, uh, grocery list that people just threw in the Geniza. Um, and, you know, the, the Geniza scholars take different frames of uh, perspective. So uh, Schechter gave uh, Lewis Ginsburg, believe it or not, this is a conundrum, uh, something that is essentially um, the Damascus document, a Dead Sea Scroll, that my teacher, uh, Dr. Joseph Baumgarten, was given by Millick, uh, Polish uh, clergyman, um, and uh, Dr. Baumgarten came out with a critical edition with studies in the Judean desert. But before Dr. Baumgarten, uh, she uh, Schechter gave Lewis Ginsburg this uh, quasi-Damascus document text, which raises the question, how did a Second Temple sex writings get into a largely medieval Geniza? The Geniza of Cairo, you know, there's apocryphal traditions that Yerimahu went there, um, but it was the shul of the Rambam, and uh, it had a Geniza above the women's section, and um, it, it, a lot of texts accrued up to the modern period. 
And Schechter gave Ginsburg uh, what he later published in German, in German, because that was the lingua franca of uh, scholarship for Jewish studies in these years of, of the late 1800s. And, Sch and Ginsburg came out with an uh, unbekannt Jüdische sect, an unknown Jewish sect, which later uh, scholars like Dr. Baumgarten hold are the Essenes. Uh, Schiffman holds, Dr. Schiffman, that they were possibly disgruntled uh, Sadducee, Sadukim, but whatever it is, they lived in near Quamran, they lived in Quamran near the Dead Sea in Nengedi. And that's a separate lecture, but Schechter also gave for Davidson a lot of poetry. And Davidson published a multi volume set um, uh, on first lines and titles uh, cataloging different poems from the Cairo Geniza. And every different scholar of Cairo Geniza has taken different Wissenschaft, the Judentum perspectives on analyzing the different types of texts that have up, up, up come from there. Uh, so you had Stefan Reif, uh, Reif, who looked at liturgical aspects of a lot of uh, the formation of the different uh, siddharim that uh, can be detective work uh, pieced together of how what we have as a sitter today. In the Gaonic time, they didn't have printed siddharim, they daven from memory. And so how did it come to be that we have, you know, Nusach Ari and uh, Nusach Sfard and Nusach Ashkenaz and many other different types of davening. Uh, that can be revealed by detective work in the Cairo Geniza that uh, Stefan Reef has done. And then you had other scholars like Gotthein, uh, who I think it was at Princeton, uh, or, and he um, was interested in business transactions in the Cairo Geniza. You know, Gotthein studied um, deeds of sale, contracts, star oak, uh, grocery lists, anything that had any mercantile basis. And he wrote a multi-volume so uh, work called um, Mediterranean Society uh, and that um, is a benchmark in its field. Many, many volumes, uh, which is based on Cairo Geniza documents. I remember looking in there and I saw something on how Hebrew teachers were paid. Well, that was a contract uh, that got Hein unveiled. And um, there are other scholars, like uh, this, this scholar at, at Princeton also named Cohn, uh, who looked at the voice of the poor. He published a two-volume set of documents from the Cairo Geniza, uh, how the Jewish uh, kahal, self-regulating institutions, uh, such as the Jewish court system and many other charitable institutions, uh, took care of the vulnerable in society, orphans, widows, and and the poor. And and so that was his approach, um, Cohen's approach to excavating Cairo Geniza. And, of course, the Cohen Gadol of a medieval Hebrew poetry, um, um, Ezra Fleischer, uh, there's a little personal note in my family, um, my grandmother's uh, cousin's husband, uh, Chaim Vilsker, sent discovered poems in the Ferkovich collection. Remember, Ferkovich excavated the Cairo Geniza before Schechter got there and brought back cartloads and cartloads of stuff for the uh, Soltikov Library in uh, Petrograd, St. Petersburg. Anyway, so in really retirement, pro bonum, our, um, Chaim Vilsker uh, found a lot of unknown poems of Rav Yehuda Levy and um, sent them cognito, incognito, under the radar, translated in Yiddish to Ezra Fleischer, who has head of the Cairo Geniza poetry unit that was originally founded by Schocken, a German philanthropist that relocated to Israel. And, and in fact, uh, Fleischer would verify that they were authentic poems of Rav Yehuda Levi that Chaim Vilsker had uncovered in the Saltykov Library and Ferkovich collection. And he did that by checking a humongous catalog uh, in Hechal Shlomo. Um, I mentioned the Cairo Geniza because um, you know, Alexander Marx is a great librarian who really didn't take credit for so many dissertations that were done in different fields of rabbinics, including scholars who analyzed the Cairo Geniza. Um, you know, the input of, of, of uh, Alexander Marx, he, it was like the basketball player, you know, who passed off in a, in a complicated maneuver uh, the, the ball to uh, the point guard who could, you know, put it in the hoop. And uh, Marx really was, looked at himself as a, a student, a Talmud of uh, Marit Steinsteiner. In the interest of time, we could say a lot more about Marx. 
Let's go to Umberto Cossuto, 1883 to 1851, a Italian rabbi and scholar. Um, and Umberto Cossuto was more than an Italian historian and biblical and Semitic scholar. Cossuto's unique academic refutation of higher biblical criticism, which Solomon Schechter called the higher anti-Semitism, was enabled in ways that did not conflict with tradition, as laid out in his path-breaking book, The Documentary Hypothesis, in which Kasuto likens himself to Shimshon, pulling down the whole edifice and fallacious foundation on which largely Protestant biblical criticism from the 19th century was, quote, foolishly grounded by assuming that such questions had not been asked millennium earlier by previous rabbinic authorities. So Kasuto was a traditional Jew, like Preuss and like Isaac Heinemann, who I mentioned were Wissenschaft scholars. And uh, Kasuto, um, for instance, gives many examples in his book to take down the documentary hypothesis, like Shimshon pulling down the temple in Ekron, or Gat. And um, one example, Jethro, Hobab, you know, the biblical, higher biblical critics were so, thought they were doing something new. Ein chandash takan Shemesh. You know, um, in the Midrash, Kasuto mentions uh, Jethro Hobab had seven names. So they would make a big simus over um, J, P, E, and D, uh, two diff four different scribal strands, uh, and they argued there were characteristics about each of these strands that knit together by divine inspiration uh, and weaved uh, what later became as the uh, uh, Torah, and Kasuda saw, saw through this farce, and he saw it from a traditional Jew's point of view, that they were denying revelation, Torah Misinai, Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, because they're saying that a divinely inspired writing, even however divinely inspired, is still a human product. You know, so what's the difference between teaching in, you know, humanities schools, uh, you know, the Bible, along with other great works of Shakespeare and Don Quixote, of Cervantes and Moliere and Racine and Corneille and other great writers like Ger Goethe. Well, Kusuda knows as an Orthodox Jew, there's a big difference that one is divinely revealed and one is very, um, even if it's a matter of genius like Shakespeare or Goethe uh, and great writers, um, it still is a human product or construction that either is constructed or deconstructed and, and the Tanakh has something divinely revealed. So he had a mission as a traditional Jew to crit critique uh, the documentary hypothesis. And I don't want to go into details of the documentary hypothesis. I've read hundreds of books on it. But in a nutshell, let's say Devarim, you know, has Deuteronomic theology. If you disobey these rules and laws, you'll be zapped in Kitabo, for instance. And Sefer Eov, which they argue was written by a different uh, scribal school, challenged that theology because basically Eov who Tom, who Yashar, who Yerei Hashem, who swore Meira, and yet he zapped. Now the Rambam comes up, he zapped because he was a Bayoni that had to be brought over from serving on a Madrega of Yira to a Madrega of Ahava. Rav Saji Dagon doesn't give that reason. He says that Eov was serving um, and silent Hashem in Paro's court when they decided to drown the Hebrew boys. And that's the reason Hashem allowed the Satan, Yimak Shemo, to allow the test. So these biblical critics, uh, they had an elaborate, sophisticated theory. They were largely Protestant, German, modern scholars of biblical texts, and, and Kasuto saw right through it. But Kasuto did much more. As Solomon Schechter understood, perhaps the best in labeling the higher criticism as the higher anti-Semitism, the hidden agenda and bias of the newfangled modern biblical criticism was to undermine the rabbinic authority as part of the spirit of its times and the historical factors that contributed during the Enlightenment to the acculturation, assimilation, and weakening of not only historical Jewish memory among the masses, but indeed any notion of sacred by preserving recollection of authoritative Masora, by which the text received its proper reception history, rather than some Johnny-come-latelys modern biblical critics representing the forces of alienation, acculturation from tradition, and destruction of that tradition, for that matter, is emblematically represented by Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, in his work, The Letters of Ben Uziel, which <coughs> Hirsch addresses a young, perplexed youth named Binyamin, uh, and Hirsch tries to show you can be an Orthodox Jew in the modern uh, variety and still 
have a worldly profession and live in the modern world. Let's go back to Kasuto. From 1925 to 33, Kasuto served as a professor of Hebrew language and literature at the University of Florence. In 1933, Kasuto received a similar appointment at the University of Rome. While there, he cataloged as a librarian the Hebrew manuscripts of the Vatican Library. This is exceptional. Jews were not allowed to go into the Vatican Library, which is extensive. It's one of the great collections. The Vatican, uh, you know, had a recension of the Hebrew Bible that is very early, before you know, the Dutch Sea Scrolls came to light, which do have the Isaiah Scroll and things that just, you know, are from Second Temple times. It, it was thought that the Aleppo Codex that Rambam examined uh, was the authoritative Masoretic text, the Vatican recension, and the Leningrad Codex. Anyway, so Kasuto was allowed to be a librarian there. That's pretty amazing. Kasuto, like all the other Jewish professors, was dismissed from the University of Rome with the racial laws instituted in 1938. Kasuto was also a lifelong Zionist. Kasuto accepted an invitation to fill the chair of biblical studies at Hebrew U in 1939, where he taught until his passing in 51. Kasuto also published in various... Uh, various scholarly periodicals, catalogs of the Hebrew manuscripts and incunabula in various Florentine libraries that were models of their type. Casuto's historical research culminated in his great work, Gli Ibrea Firenze nel Eta del Rinascimento in 1918, 1918, which displays a remarkable mastery of the source material from both the Florentine archives and the Hebrew manuscripts in many countries. He also contributed articles on Jewish subjects to the Encyclopedia Italiana. Those on Jewish literature were republished in the book form as Storia della Literatura Ebraica Post Biblica in 1938. In addition, Casuto published basic articles on the Judeo Italian dialect and Hebrew inscriptions of southern Italy um, and various allied subjects. Uh, recently, I did a bibliography for somebody who was working. Uh, on an exhibit um, of an early uh, edition of Rashi uh, by Gaston that appears in Calabria. And, and Casuto had already described that, that reception history long before this exhibit. His primary contribution, however, is Shirat HaAliyah Israel, which was published in 1944 in the Knesset 8, English translation in Biblical and Oriental Studies 2. I think that was done by Harry Orlinsky, editor. Among his books on biblical research are a critique of the documentary hypothesis of the composition of Genesis in Italian, La Questiona del Genesia, in 1934, and in Hebrew, Perush al Sefer Breshit, two volumes, 1944 to 49. A commentary on the book of Genesis, two volumes, appeared in 61 and 64 as well. A commentary on Shemot appeared as Perush al Sefer Shemot in 42. A commentary on reappeared in 1967 on Shemot, and he also wrote Torah Ha Teudot in 1941. Uh, the documentary Hypothesis in 61 was reissued. He was a chief editor of the biblical encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Mikra'it. Uh, Kasuto's scholarship was not independent of his bibliographic and liter librarian detective sleuthing when identifying the Aleppo Codex. And I could spend ages talking about Casuto and his importance, but I'm just going to highlight it with one anecdote. The genius of Casuto not only shows his knowledge of what is in the books of the library, but his ability to apply authoritative, traditional, orthodox, Masoretic knowledge to the bibliographic act of identifying and verifying, quote, what was supposed to, for a century to be a pious legend of the Jewish community of Aleppo and was disbelieved by most scholars named the Aleppo Codex, is the self-same model codex declared as most authoritative by Randmam in his great Halakha Commandium, the Mishnah Torah, with regard to certain fundamental questions of preparing Sifre Torah. And Kasuto was sent by the Israeli government to examine the Aleppo Codex. Kasuto, with his knowledge of the Rambam, was able to verify and identify that the Aleppo Codex is most likely the Codex of Rambam, and as such became the halakhically binding model for later generations and recensions. Kasuto's proof is based on Rambam's identifying 
an odd irregular number of Pesukim in the Aleppo Codex in Shiratayam, in Parsha Beshalach, that is Shemot Yud Dalid, and in Parsha Hazinu, the Song of Moshe in Deuteronomy 32, and the open and closed sections. So the way uh, Kasudo broke this code, so to speak, is that the Rambam notes when he was identifying uh, the Aleppo Codex, Rambam is 1135 to 1204, he noticed that Sharon Hayam had 67 lines, and the normal in Ashkenaz tradition is 70. So Kasudo used the logic, if the Aleppo Codex of the Jews of Aleppo uh, is really the one that Maimonides identified and handled, it's going to have that 67 lines in the Shir Hayam, which make it unusual. And sure enough, when Kasudo finally got a chance and convinced and persuaded the Aleppo community to let him look at the Aleppo Codex, he went straight to Shemot Yud Dalid, and he looked at how the song was laid out in brick-like form, and um, sure enough, it had 67 lines, irregular. That was a uh, piece of evidence that this was Rambam's Aleppo Codex examined by the Rambam. From Jacob ben Chaim to Bear and Ginsburg, determining if the Aleppo Codex indeed is the text sanctioned by Rambam became an ultimate goal for the ideological sits minia verbo, assumptions of editors of printed Bibles. This was a great preoccupation of Wissens of Heinrich Ratz in 1871 attempted to authenticate the claim of the community of Aleppo of the authenticity of the Aleppo Codex. The Aleppo ribbon in it was cautious and distrustful of the Wissenschaft scholars. Thus, no modern scholar was allowed to investigate and handle the codex uh, uh, or photograph it for microfilm. A number of scholars, including Paul Kale, who I cite in German in my book, Gluskin Family History, in regards to Samaritan manuscripts that uh, Chaim Vilsker also, he did a Samaritan dictionary, and Kale wrote about it. Anyway, Kale doubted the Aleppo community's claims and dated the manuscript later than the time of the Rambam. Kasudo proved that wrong. As history would have it, Kasudo played the key role in the identification of the Aleppo Codex. This was based on Kasudo's physical examination of the text after permission given from the Aleppo rabbinate. And, you know, um, Kasudo based his proof on a number of things. I mentioned Rambam's own rules and remarks about the Codex. One, Rambam notes the copy examined had 67 verses in uh, Sherayam and Bishalach found in Spanish and Yemenite scrolls as opposed to the regular 70 number of verses found in many Ashkenaz manuscripts, Sifre Torah, and codexes, which may be based on an esoteric gematria. Maimonides states that he noted down the open and closed sections as well as the layout of the two Pentateuchal songs according to that model codex, the Aleppo Codex. Thus, the point of focus for Rambam is one, open and closed sections, and sh- uh, the Song of Moses in Devarim Lamed Bet, and uh, the Song of Moses in Shemot Yud Dalad. And also, number four, the numbers of lines preceding and following the Song of Moses. So Rambam writes, the layout of the Song of Moses, every single line has a space in its middle, like a closed section, so that every line is divided into two, and it is written in 70 lines. Maimonides states that the number of lines is 70. The statement destined halacha. Rambam decided that the Song of Moses should be written in 70 lines and the verses of the following prose section in five lines. The Hameiri held, however, that the correct way is 67 lines for the song and six lines for the closing section. Maimonides' decision was accepted by many later decisors, such as the Machaber Rabbi Yosef Karo in the Shulchan Aruch, and the Beit Yosef. The Aleppo Codex is not only the oldest complete codex of the Tiberian Bible text known of the Masorah, but is it altogether the earliest complete codex of the Masoretic subsystem, which had been perfected by the Ben Asher family. Maimonides, I could go on for ages about Ben Asher family. In fact, when we do our lecture on Jewish music, we'll spend a significant amount of time about how the Ben Asher family put in the cantillation, the trope, and the musical notes on the letters for how to lane in a standardized form uh, the Masoretic texts 
uh, Ezra had legislated the Torah being laid on Monday and and um, Thursdays, and of course Shabbos. Uh, but the Masoretes of Asher ben Asher family um, they put in a standardization of how to chant the text. So when Yosef, you know, was faced with the temptation of Potiphar's wife, you have a special trump that's unique, what we call Hapix Legomena, so to speak, that, you know, he really delayed. He had to think about the temptation. <clears throat> but then, according to tradition, he saw an image of his father, Yaakov Avinu, and prevented him from doing the Avera. Anyway, this Asher ben Asher family did more than the cantillation. Uh, they counted words um, and they noted the nun, nun hamafuch, the upside down nun, uh, and they did all sorts of notations of a kind of mathematical enumeration, what today we might call, um, uh, you know, statistical sorts of data keeping. But Asher ben Asher family also wrote uh, in Tiberia a wonderful work that's not so well known. It's called Sefer Tame Hatamim, the reason for the trop. Um, and in that work, the Asher ben Asher family notes that uh, when you sing the notes correctly uh, in their cantillation system, it will be a maftiach, a key, that will open the gates in heaven. And then he brings down an even more powerful metaphor, that the written text, the black letters on the parchment, are the body of the Jews. But the music, or the cantillation that the Asher ben Asher family standardized, is the ruach, or spirit, of the Jews. And when you sing the body with the pro proper notes, the spirit, you resurrect the text. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor? So, um, Maimonides' identification of the Aleppo Codex as containing the complete Bible proved significant in the, in the Mishnah Torah, Sefer Ava, Hilchot Sefer Torah 8.4, uh, Rambam writes about this. The Cairo MS of Moses ben Asher was reconsidered by Kasudo with the qualification and caveat, Ulai, perhaps, and most likely, to the rank and file of the MS which Rambam consulted, and thus it was chosen for the Bible edition which Kasuto was planning. Um, the history of the Aleppo Codex, we don't have time to go into, perhaps a separate lecture. Um, pieces became uh, separated uh, due to war, and, you know, you had, like, sections of it put in um, cigarette boxes and smuggled out of Aleppo, uh, to Eretz Israel and so forth, and Baruch Hashem, the uh, Israeli government has uh, tried to reconstitute uh, the separated text and keeps it under lock and key in a vault. Um, let's go on to Gershom Sholem in the interest of time, 1897 to 1982. Speaking on the occasion of Sholem's 60th birthday in 1958, Agnon expressed the esteem in which the Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzweig the author of Die Stern der Erlösung and Das Neues Denken and other things, as well as the translation of Rav Yehuda Levy's poems into German, which when we do the lecture on Rav Yehuda Levy, I hope to cite uh, the translation of some of the uh, Hebrew poems into German by Rosenzweig. So Franz Rosenzweig, his younger scholar Sholem, was a great scholar. Rosenzweig knew Sholem before Sholem made Aliyah. Rosenzweig noted, quote, Sholem's great knowledge, vast erudition, his precision to cite sources, his striving to return the Makor primary sources, his critical analysis, his astounding breadth and depths of his memory, and his ability to cast off and break through shells, klipot, that are outer superfluous and mere intellectual uh, containers to penetrate to the core, generating the intellectual equivalent of nuclear fission. Sholem, I think, used uh, the term um, shibor hageronim, breaking the the seeds of a sunflower. When Agnon once visited Rosenzweig, after Sholem had just visited Rosenzweig, Rosenzweig remarked to Agnon, quote, I believe Gershom, that is Gershom Sholem, may become a Corbin to the bibliography of the Kabbalah. That is, that's a librarian metaphor, that he might become a Corbin to the bibliography of the academic study of Sifre Kabbalah. But he added, the Corbin is worthy of the altar. Isn't that a great metaphor? Sholem, as a bibliographer, went beyond mere listing of books and annotating bibliographies. His multifaceted scholarship, which operated 24-7 and was a mission, even when strolling in Mea Sharim to scour used Jewish bookstores for texts, 
always viewed books themselves as the noble keys and and sepulchers enabling his creative work. He had great reverence and respect for text. Scholem purchased his first book on the Kabbalah in Berlin in 1915. It was a copy of the Zohar, on which he inscribed on the title page, Gershom Ish Shalem, a allusion to his name. 22 years later, in his home in Yerushalayim, he owned multiple editions and impressions of the Zohar, in over 222 editions. This Deridian archive fever cannot be described as bourgeois, a Basabane's gentle madness. Rather, Sholem's library was a reflection of the extension of his intellectual quest and kindred soul for the subject. Sholem paid to bring to Israel when he made Aliyah 2,000 books, 600 of them on Kabbalah. One reason driving Sholem to make Aliyah, besides being a strong, unrepentant Zionist, is his desire to explore the abundance of Sfarim that were found in Jerusalem. Sholem was captivated by the prospect of the book trade in Israel at the time post-World War I. Immediately upon his arrival, Sholem began to scour all the bookshops of the Old City's Jewish Quarter and the Meir Sharim neighborhood and throughout Israel. As he put it in his memoirs with the JNUL, located at the time in the B'nai B'rith house, was his pat place of work. Nearby, Meir Sharim was my playground. In 1937, Sholem printed Kuntris Alu Le Shalom, that is, Come to Peace, which is a pun on the Bibliophile's last name, a list of rare titles on Kabbalah and Sifrei HaSidot. It contained 80 rare titles in Hebrew and 31 in other languages. Sholem holding that the translations as a form of interpretation were essential to understanding as his friend Walter Benjamin put it in the Afgaba des Ubersetzers, the, the homework or the mission of translation, the task of translation, to discern the cultural spirit of an age. And in my work on comparing the Septuagint and the Vulgate and the Targumim and um, German translations and French translations and the uh, Yiddish translations of the Tanakh, the Schmultaich, I actually... Um, cite in German uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, classic essay, The Aufgabe des Übersetzers. Anyway, Scholem liked the last scene in the film Amadeus Mozart, in which the genius Mozart on his deathbed writes his own resurrection, resurrection symphony. Analogously, on Scholem's deathbed, gave instructions for purchasing his books to have a good home. Can you imagine? Like, Scholem was concerned about his books at the very end, as it goes us. Sholem's magnanimity is seen in his donation of a magnificent library of more than 25,000 Jewish volumes, which he gifted to JNUL, which still is alive, containing not only printed books, but manuscripts, pamphlets, broadsheets, all prints in the field of Jewish mysticism and Hasidut. Sholem arrived in Jerusalem in 1923 and opted to work in the library, dealing with books rather than, as he wrote, working teaching math at a teacher seminary. My grandmother, or Rob Gliskin's um, brother-in-law, Saul Lieberman, actually taught mathematics in Israel. You know, um, this a lot of Jewish scholars were doing this um, because, you know, it wasn't uh, easy to find a shtel in Eretz Israel to teach in Jewish studies. Sholem noted, the choice motivated because at the library he would be dealing with books and almost everything about them that interests Sholem and made him tick. From 1923 to 1927, Sholem was head of the JNUL's Hebraica and Judaica department. His post was financed by what he called the Schnoring Fund. He had a sense of humor, a euphemism for cash donations left by visiting tourists and only later formally established in trust. So Sholem, like Steinsteiner, lived very poor. Therefore, under difficult circumstance with lacks of financial resources, Sholem helped Bergman, who was a philosophy expert, build the library collection. In 1927, the library published a classification system for Judaica developed and introduced by Sholem. The system provided more room for enumeration than the Dewey system, and today the LC system for that matter, because call numbers were given special requirements of Jewish studies knowledge to classify the field of Jewish mysticism in Hasidut. In 1930, Sholem published a catalog 
of the Kabbalistic manuscripts owned by JNUL, prepared with the help of scholar Issachar Yoel, which is an essential research source to this day. If I could only mention something about his catalog classification system. At the AJL in uh, San Diego, I gave a paper comparing classification systems of Judaica. So there's the Friday system that was used at the New York Public Library. I think it is still today. It's called Pie in the Sky system. And uh, a lot can be said about that. And then there's, of course, the Sholem system that is very specific in enumeration for ha Hasidut and Jewish mysticism. That is to say, like in medicine, that we use mesh headings, uh, which allow more enumeration in the field of science than Library of Congress. So um, in my collection that I work in, we use Library of Congress A to Q, and then Q, which starts with mathematics and goes to all the sciences. Uh, we use National Library of Medicine system. I only mention National Library of Medicine system because that type of precision that goes into knowing the field, knowing the contents of the books that enable the facet analysis of the mesh system uh, is what Sholem had in knowing the contents of Sifre Kabbalah and Hasidut to create a library classification system the way we organize books on the shelves um, that provided more room and enumeration. So, you know, it's, it's a really an amazing system. There are other systems out there, the Vine, the Likin, the Elazar, but, you know, Sholem's system is my favorite. Let's go on. Um, the relationship of Sholem's research and teaching to his bibliographic and library activities are essential to each other, working in tandem. Two of Sholem's works are devoted completely to bibliography. As early as 1927, he published his Bibliographia Kabbalistica. It contains 1,302 entries on Kabbalah and a list of 273 editions of Sefer HaZohar and its addenda and perushim. How the young 14-year-old's first purchase of a set of Sefer HaZohar in Berlin grew into a definitive editions of its recensions and offshoots is remarkable. Dr. Malachi Beit Ari notes that Sholem's own working copy is so marked up with hundreds of additional handwritten ent 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 entries that it itself is a treasure trove of insights for scholarship. Um, I could mention also that Sholem did a uh, was doing a lexicon for Kabbalistic terms, uh, which was continued uh, by his students, I think Isaiah Tishby and others. Uh, and that catalog you can still see, or last time I was there, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem's JNUL Library. Um, further in, I think it's, it might have been relocated off-site because it took up a lot of room. Further in 1928, Sholem published an annotated bibliography of the literature of Bratslav Hasidim. He dedicated this as a 50th anniversary birthday present to his friend Martin Buber. This booklet was playfully endowed with an apothecite gematria for the year of the book's publication. Uh, Sholem's dedication of the annunciation of the published work to his friend Martin Buber was a way Sholem linked bibliography and academic scholarship in general, not as a game with words or some construct of some academic of game theory, but as an act of intellectual friendship and real friendship of the living, real presence of being devoted to uh, the kindred spirit of the life of the mind. Sholem put himself at risk to retrieve and bring back to the JNL confiscated Nazi, quote, loot of the treasury of the rabbinic library that the Nazis wanted for display, learning about rather than from, quote, a museum to the murdered Jewish race. I reviewed for a journal Sholem's letters and in there, he describes going to the uh, uh, Offenbach Depot on behalf of the Israeli government. Uh, just as Kasuto was sent to Aleppo to examine the Aleppo Codex, Sholem was sent by the Israeli government to bring back steamer trunks of uh, manuscripts after the Shoah. And one of the places was Offenbach. And he stopped off in his Offenbach uh, retrieval of, quote, redeeming the captives, that is, books that the Nazis wanted to have to a, a museum to the murdered Jewish race, the Jews are religion come in all different ethnic groups. Um, Sholem went for a walk in the cemetery of Prague and, and actually was reduced to tears, uh, not just from the incredibly amazing Matsevot that are there, but the incredible renaissance and flourishing of Jewish life, not just with the Maral and the Tosafet Yom Tov, and the Shnei Luchot Abrit, Rabbi Horowitz, who all lived in Prague, I believe, and are 
buried in that cemetery, but even secular Jews like Kafka are buried in that cemetery um, in Prague. And Sholem was reduced to tears. And that shows how much he loved the Jewish people. And in fact, he revoked Hannah Arendt when she wrote Eichmann in Jerusalem and she attended the trial and she coined the phrase banality of evil. In all fairness to Arendt, she had written in 1952 uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism where she referred to Nazi atrocities as radical evil, radical boza, as we would say in German, uh, ra radicali, but th that is Nazi sport mocking of taking pleasure as Amalekites and um, the, imposing suffering on innocent people, you know, hitting old people over the heads to death and throwing babies in alive, making lampshades out of skin and making human fat into soap, stuff like that is really cruel and inhuman Amalekites and worse things, you know, that I can't even recount. I have one family member, the Eisenbergs, uh, I think one of the family members was caught stealing a potato to survive, uh, or potato skin rather, and they had a little, like, uh, demonstration uh, at, at 3 in the morning a.m. in Auschwitz, and uh, Eisenberg was marched out, and it's freezing there in the winter with snow and everything, and they doused him with water, which immediately froze on his body, and he had a heart attack. And then, if that wasn't insult to injury, uh, they um, hung him. Another Jew in the family uh, recalls that one of their relatives uh, was made into a fox hunt, that they didn't feed the German shepherds dogs, which were treated better than the Jews in the camps, with shelter and food, and um, they didn't feed the dogs for quite a while, and the dogs got hungry, and then they uh, took you know some sort of food and coated the thin out, uh, outfit that the Jews had to wear in the cold, freezing Auschwitz, and they, they let the dogs go to have a fox hunt to rip apart, uh, you know, the rabbit or whatever that they get pleasure watching foxes go after rabbits or something. Anyway, I mention this because Sholem uh, understood the radical evil that had occurred in Europe for the annihilation, the Vernichtung des Alles Juden in Europa, the Korban Europa, uh, and he was brought to tears walking in the Prague uh, Cemetery. Uh, so he put himself at risk to bring back these books uh, to the JNUL. He referred to it as redeeming the captives. He risked all to bring back the, quote, captives, like in Jewish law, having likened them to going over a waterfall, a mabul. And he brought them back to the Jewish homeland rather than let them sit unused, unconsulted, merely as so much investment capital in the libraries of Europe, whose host culture had played a significant role in the eradication of the living culture in Europe of Jews, to which these books in part testify as a long living and vibrant cultural presence in Europe. I remember I was in a European library in France. Was it the uh, Alliance Israelite Universal? And at that time, they let people just walk through the stacks of really incredible things. Yeah, I saw German and French works, you know, tens of thousands of works that were just on the, the circulating shelves that attests to this vibrancy of the Wissenschaft des Judentum and the output there of applying modern academic critical study of cognate Semitic languages and other methods to Jewish texts. Now, Sholem is reported, for instance, to have wept, as I mentioned in his letters, while walking in the cemetery in Prague, home to Godolim as the Maral, uh, Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz, the Shnei Luchot Abrit, and the Tosvat Yom Tov in Franz Kafka, uh, because Sholem took to heart uh, his dedication and love of the cultural legacy of the Jewish people and rabbinic elites. And when he critiqued Hannah Arendt for writing that book about Eichmann, Yamak Shemo, and, you know, introducing this notion of banality of evil, um, he said, Dear Hannah, uh, you know, have more hearts and kite for your, your annihilated people there in Europe that suffered the terrible degradation and annihilation from the Nazis. And um, he said, you know, Hannah, you're dealing with high ideas. It's true that what you're saying is correct, that you mean by banality as the rootinization, the banaliza the uh, uh, institutionalization and the um, rootinization of making radical evil commonplace, just liquidating, let's say today, Muncie and Passaic Jewish neighborhoods and Brooklyn and Crown Heights and whatever wherever Jews live. And uh, he's, he urged her to have more hearts and kite, even though they made radical evil commonplace, or what you refer to as banal. And that is correct to say, 
You should not have introduced that concept to the Jewish public, or any public for that matter, that would misunderstand your Kantian distinction between radical boza and banal boza. Anyway, Sholem also in his lifetime supervised the Committee of the Hebrew Paleography Project. In 1965, his proposal to the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities to study all dated medieval Hebrew manuscripts and gather information about their technical, technological and graphic features and then to computerize his data for further analysis to arrive at knowledge of Hebrew typology was a mission in which Sholem invested great enthusiasm. If I may return to his critique of Hannah Arendt, we see Hannah Arendt's thesis is correct. You find it in Goldhagen's thesis, you know, uh, the Fuhrer and his willing executioners. So at the basis of that is that, you know, you had a certain percentage of people that were Amalekite sadists who enjoyed throwing children into ovens alive. And that's horrific. Remember, Amalek went after the children and the sick and the old people. And that happened in the Shoah. But it was enabled and allowed by ambivalent, careless, indifferent bystanders. The Chavetz Chaim notes, al damre echa, is a fundamental principle of viewing all Jews as fellow Jews. Um, raving Lizette, Lizette. And um, what Hunter Rent was describing in Goldhagen a little bit later, in our own age, is how banal evil works in tandem with radical evil. You have these cruel Amalekites that are horrific, you know, uh, that inflict suffering, like enjoy watching human gladiators kill each other like Roman in the Colosseum, or people that, as Rambam would say, is a, a pagan likes a good fight of either, you know, roosters pecking each other to death or pit bulls. Um, that's not Jewish, Rambam says in the Bukuach. And um, so that's radical evil, that type of sport mocking, Nazi sport mocking. Uh, but it's enabled by the bystanders, the ambivalent, the indifferent, who benefited greatly economically from the fleecing and murder of the Jews. You know, the Polish pig farmer uh, could pave their pigsties with Jewish cemetery stones, which is a desecration of the name. And, um, you know, the museums in Europe could benefit by housing great art that was owned previously by Jews who were murdered after being fleeced. And, you know, if you handle Deutschmark, you're handling possibly the same currency that might have been handled by a Jew who was murdered and robbed. And the radical and banal evil is those bystanders. The bystanders are the banal evil that tolerate and look the other way, see no evil, do no evil. You know, everybody could smell the stench around Auschwitz. They knew uh, of burning bodies. It's not pleasant. And people knew that the Jewish neighborhoods were liquidated. But, you know, business as usual, banal evil, just as Otto Orlendorf said, I was a mass murderer, a death murderer, he said, uh, to put food on the table for my family. That is banal evil and radical evil working in tandem. And that's what Hannah Arendt, and later in some degree Goldhagen, are getting at. And Sholem understood that, that what you're describing is a correct, uh, you might be a scientist describing the way a molecule works of how horrific evil happens and catastrophe and suffering in the world. But you shouldn't have released the idea of banal evil, which be so misunderstood by the masses, the oilem is a goilem. And he, he said, Hannah, you got to have more Herzenkite. He also felt for Hannah Arendt because she was horribly abused by Martin Heidegger, uh, who used her as some sort of uh, concubine. Um, and Heidegger was married, by the way, he committed adultery. And um, Hannah Arendt didn't see she was being used by him. And, Arendt, and Sholem felt for her. He felt very badly for her. Um, and he offered him her Musar when she wrote the Eichmann book. Because just in 1952, basically uh, over a decade earlier, she had stuck by the concept of radical evil in the origins of totalitarianism. So uh, Sholem was a great bibliographer. Um, he supervised... The Committee of Hebrew Paleography Project in 65, his proposal to the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities to study all dated Hebrew, Hebrew manuscripts and gather information about their technical, technological, and graphic features, and then to computerize this data for further analysis to arrive at knowledge of Hebrew typography and typology was a mission in which Sholem invested great enthusiasm. And that was a mission, a very uh, librarian science type of mission. 
Thirdly, Sholem supported the project of the Institute of Microfilmed Hebrew Manuscripts from collections around the world in order to identify and catalog them 25 years before David Ben-Gurion initiated the establishment of his institute. Um, Sholem wrote to his friend Chaim Bialik, the requisite MS must be photographed and assembled in a special collection under the Aegeus of, of the JNUL so that those which are not published by scholars will yet be available for all the generations to come. This must be systematic, comprehensive, and with a method. That Again, the Germanic spirit, thoroughness and systematic. What I think Richard Rubinstein said that this Germanic trait of being thorough and comprehensive uh, was used to solve the Yudha Fraga, the Jewish question, uh, through, uh, you know, Vernictal Honest to Yudha in the Ganzen Belt. And um, so that, you have to be careful that, that their thoroughness can also be used for evil as well as for good, which is a bibliographer trying to document all and comprehensively and thoroughly aspects of a recension history. Let's get to Dr. R.A. Chaim Vilsker, 1919 to 1988. So uh, Vilsker, I must say, is a personal aspect of my life and who I view as my model in librarianship. I merely sit at his feet and listen to his great monologues. You have to understand that my grandmother, Miriam Zakhalan Rakha's cousin, first cousin, was uh, Gita Gluskina, who married Dr. Chaim Vilsker. Gita Gluskina was a great scholar in her own right. I published on this in the Gluskin family history. And uh, if you want to know more about Gita Gluskina, Dr. Gluskina, and Dr. Vilsker, and um, uh, Lea Gluskina, Dr. Lea Gluskina, who was an expert in Second Temple Judaism, uh, on Philo Josephus' formation of the Mishnah, she knew Latin and Greek as well. And she was married to a great scholar named uh, Joseph David Amundsen, who published a lot on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then another sister was Sonia Gluskin, who was one of the world's expert on medieval Russian, Cyrillic, and Russian literature to boot. And then there was a sister, Esther, who joined Hashem Ratzair, a secular Zionist organization. But these four daughters came from Rob Menachem Mendel Gluskin and Fredo Rabinovich Gluskin as Rob Menachem's Father-in-law was Eliezer Rabinovich, who was the Abedin of Minsk, and uh, Rabbi Eliezer Rabinovich's uh, father-in-law was the Minsker Gadol, Rabbi Yerachim Perlman. But Rob Gluskin, as Dr. Lieberman, his brother, said, was an exotic plant at the um, Shabbos table because he was a chassid. Rob Menachem's father was Rabbi Aaron Ori Gluskin of Parich, after the Chabad luminary Rabbi Hillel Parich. And Rabbi Aaron was the son of Rabbi Yeshua Gluskin of Lvov, who married the daughter of Rabbi Dan of Slonim. So you had Slonim intermarrying with Chabad, because Rabbi uh, Yeshua Gluskin was a Chabadnik, Lubavitch. And to make a long story short, uh, the Rabbi Yeshua Gluskin was the grandson of Rabbi Moshe Zev Gluskin, whose father was Rabbi Eliezer Gluskin, who were great scholars, um, actually gave a hespid for the Gra and... Uh, Rabbi Eliezer Gluskin, uh, the father of Moshe Zeb, uh, actually was a comrade of, confident of the Nitziv. Um So it shows that there wasn't this, you know, polarization of Mitnagdim against Hasidim that was so vicious. You had a respect for Torah because both Hasidim and Mitnagdim respected Torah and Torah as uh, the elixir of life, the compass, the GPS system for how we live our lives. And I only mention this because the son-in-law, besides Joseph David Amundsen, of uh, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Gluskin, Abed Din of Minsk, after Eliezer Rabinovich, was Dr. Chaim Vilsker. And we're now going to discuss some of the incredible discoveries and librarian work of Dr. Vilsker. Dr. Vilsker was the head librarian of the, quote, Semitics Department of the Ferkovich Collection in the Saltykov Library in St. Petersburg. If you want to know more about this, see this book, Gluskin Family History. Um, I should mention uh, Vilsker's uh, wife, Dr. Gita, published a doctorate also on Rabbi Yehuda Al-Harizi, best known for the Takamoni, and she found an unpublished manuscript of Al-Harizi in the Saltykov Library in Geniza. Um, and she later went on in her career to do a very important 
critical edition of a mathematical Hebrew work from the Middle Ages that required learning science, like Kiddush uh, Chodesh, uh, the sanctification of the new moon, and all the mathematics involved in that. Um, and she was a great lover of poetry, as her son, Dr. Emanuel Gluskin, who take, kept the name Gluskin, because, uh, uh, you know, Rob Gluskin had four daughters, so he did not keep the name Vilsker. And I, I'm going to now give a tribute to Dr. Vilsker, who I admire greatly. Um, in January of 1949, Vilsker proposed to my aunt, my, my grandmother's co first cousin, Dr. Guido Gluskin, and in December 1949, their son, Dr. Emanuel Gluskin Schlito, uh, who became an electrical engineer, Dr. Alha Hashmani, uh, uh, um, Hashmal, uh, electrical engineer, uh, getting a visa out in 1975, was born, and he's now living in Jerusalem. Uh, the younger son, Boris, with his mother, Gita, and wife, Katya, and two sons, had relocated to Israel in 1990. The grandchildren, Misha and Sasha, grew up and served in the army. Um, Vilsker had two grandfathers that were Talmud scholars with whom Lev, uh, I mean, Chaim Vilsker learned. Later, a Talmud teacher was employed, uh, but his grandfathers continued teaching and testing Chaim Vilsker on Fridays at the end of the week. Meanwhile, a grandmother would invite um, Chaim Vilsker to another room where she secretly gave him a small glass of wine and a piece of Lekha honey cake as a reward for his learning, a taste of the world to come. That was an incentive, but later he learned Lishma. His mother would serve the Talmud Malamed with the great respect and honor, always preparing a glass of tea for the teacher. The Malamed would say, this comes down in our family history, um, Gemara never cools down, yet a tea can cool down. The Gemara veit nit kalt varn, und die tea kan kalt varn. The Talmud teacher initiated Vilsker into the rhythms and warps and whoop of Aramaic of the Bavli, with its sing-song cadences of uh, Ma'i Kamash Malan, what does this mean? And Mana, Hani Mili, how do we know this? Etc. My focus on Vilsker, the librarian, illustrates how a great scholar drew on his research and linguistic knowledge of Hebrew and Aramaic and many other languages to unravel one of the most important discoveries, namely over 22 unknown poems of Rabbi Yehuda Levi in Hebrew, found in the Saltykov Library in Petrograd. Vilsker's example also shows how difficult it was in Russia for Jews to not only pursue scholarly careers in Hebrew philology, but also to be Jews, as Vilsker will see, was surveilled continuously by the KGB. Vilsker, in his semi-retirement, accessed fragments of the Cairo Geniza that previously had been unknown to the world at large. This became the Ferkowitz collection that he excavated from the Cairo Geniza before Solomon Schechter. Schechter had access to the leftovers, as Ferkovich, uh, his gathering of Geniza fragments was previous. Vilsker played a key role in clandestinely disseminating knowledge of these unknown Geniza works of Yudov of Levi that Ferkovich assembled from the Saltykov Library in Petrograd before Schechter's efforts. Let's go back. In 1950, Chaim Vilsker graduated from the university with a diploma in linguistic semitologist and received a position in the State Public Library named after Saltykov Shredrin at the Department of Hebrew and Yiddish Books, which was later renamed the Department of Literatures of Asia and Africa. There he was renamed, renamed Lev Yefimovich by the staff. He was a librarian and advanced to senior bibliographic research. Um, Lev means heart, like Leo uh, means lion. Uh, he was called Arye Vilsker later in Israel. Professor Vinikov wrote a letter of recommendation that Dr. Chaim Vilsker saved and later relayed to his son, Dr. Emanuel Gluskin, who made Aliyah and lives in Jerusalem. Dr. Emanuel gave me this letter. Dr. Gluskin sent me the letter in Russian, which in translation reads, Vilsker, born in 1919, had entered the Oriental Department of Leningrad State University uh, as a second-year student of the Division of Assyriology and Hebraistics in 1996. Before that, Vilsker had attended Leningrad Pedagogical Institute of Foreign Languages. Vilsker had been studying seriously the Semitic languages, Arabic, Ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, Syrian, uh, and Samaritan. And he also devoted a lot of attention to medieval philosophy 
and Jewish history by taking a number of both general and special courses and lectures and by conducting an extensive review of literature. In addition, Comrade Vilsker has been studying independently the recently found Ugarit in the inscripts that represent the extremely important cultural mo monuments. He learned Ugarit for this purpose. These resulted in his course project, Laryngeal Sounds in Ugarit Language, which demonstrates a profoundness of the author's approach to the analysis of the poorly understood and complex linguistic problems of Ugarit. He dedicated his diploma project to the word formation in Hebrew language. This is a question of considerable interest and importance for Hebrew linguists, which was not explored properly by science. The diploma project had received the highest praise from the Committee of the Department of Arabic Philology in May of 1950. The solid training received by Comrade Vilsker at the university as well as completion by him, independently the serious scientific works mentioned above, give reason to believe that he is thoroughly prepared for conducting scientific work, again, this is just a Jundum illusion, and scientific research. Senior researcher of Institute of Oriental Studies of the Academy of Sciences, USSR, signed Professor Minikov. So that's a tremendous recommendation uh, from his, one of his teachers. Despite strong recommendations, his scholarly life was not easy, particularly due to the lack of publishing opportunities in Russia, which only viewed folk languages like Yiddish as worthy of focus. He was to many an unknown. Who could know the Russian Hebrew philologist Vilsker if there was nowhere for him to be published? Vilsker wrote countless items. Over 100 have been estimated and identified in Russian and other European language, on a great breadth and depth of subjects. Vilsker scorned narrow specialization, and his knowledge was broad and immense. His works on ancient manuscripts found in the Dead Sea area, and the linguistic works of various Semitic languages, as well as his work in lexicography, were just a few of his accomplishments. A total of 100 scientific papers are ascribed to Vilsker, but he had no place often to publish his findings. Some were published in Yiddish in the journal Sovietish Heimland. But it was not easy for Vilsker to find a shtel and forum to share his uh, research. However, Rambi only retains two items relating to Vilsker's work on the Samaritans and their language. If you do a Rambi search on Vilsker, you'll see on Lieb Chaim Vilsker, Manuel d'Aramin Samaritan, Recherche Scientifique, a French translation of his Samaritan Dictionary, reviewed by Maurice Ballet in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies, volume 42, issue 4, 1983, pages 295 on. Yes, Vilsker taught himself as an autodidact the Samaritan language and Samaritan graphics, and like Avram Berliner, took pride as being an autodidact. Vilsker, as an autodidact Hebrew philologist, focused primarily on linguist aspects of the Samaritan language. His scholarly interests included the whole gamut of Jewish studies. He wrote articles on a wide range of topics. The following are the tip of the iceberg of a few of his essays characterized by Wissenschaft thoroughness and depth. So these are, were relayed to me by Dr. Emanuel Gluskin uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, one, at the root of Pushkiana among the Jews. Vilsker was also interested in, in, in secular literature. Two, works of Sholem Aleichem translated into Hebrew, as he knew Yiddish very well and he <clears throat> was interested in Yiddish literature. Three, a review of the bibliography of Mendel Moichoy Sofrim, another Yiddish writer. And four, the Metzabich Tombstone, the cover of the Baal Shem Tov, he published on that. Now, you know, he published hundreds of things. I'm not going to mention them all. One of my favorite is Unknown Letters of Rabbi, of Dr. Of, uh, Chaim Nachman Bialik, but we don't have time to list all of his publications and work. He's best known for finding uh, the unknown poems of Rabbi Yoda Levi, which he sort of did in his retirement. The Saltikov Library Publication Oriental Collection included Vilsker's published work that appeared during the years of Pestroika. Excuse me one second. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam She'akol Neyeh My voice is getting hoarse. So another amazing work that Vilsker did is called the Sefer HaHochma by Rabbi Saeed bin Babshada. 
It became the basis for numerous studies and publication. Rabbi Babshad was a philosopher and poet who lived in Babylon. Ferkovich attained this book from a grave in a Jewish cemetery in Egypt. Small fragments of the book were found in different archaeologists in different times and are now located in different libraries of the world. The Israeli scientist E. Sherman, who visited the Leningrad Library in 1960, mentioned the manuscript of Vilsker. Vilsker gave the name to the manuscript Sefer HaChokhmah, and he published on it. Vilsker's knowledge of the literature of the Middle Ages and totality of foreign languages allowed Vilsker to establish a genuine name of the author and the time of his life that belonged to the second half of the 10th century and first half of the 11th century during the bridge between the Geonim and Rishonim. He would, this uh, Bab Shada was a Persian Jew, a philosopher to boot. Dr. Ezra Fleischer argued that the author was a Persian Jew and wrote a whole book about Rabbi Said ben Babshad. Vladimir Lazarus made another translation of 37 couplets from this book, chapter Hymn to Wisdom, Shir L'Chokmah, which was published in Ariel Journal No. 15, 1993. The following is a fragment prose translation by Vilsker. So this is a translation by Vilsker. Uh, from uh, what was originally Hebrew, then into Yiddish, and now, and then into Russian, and then here it, I'm going to do it in English. The moon and the sun are shining. Thee are the greatest of the stars. But in the light of Hokma, all stars are pale. The tiaras are numerous. The decorations are luxurious. But before the crown cater Hokma, all tiaras deteriorate. The pure gold, Zahav Tahara, is magnificent. The precious stones, Sapir, are splendid. But before the charm of wisdom, they all fade, for wisdom goes to the depth. That's a little snippet from this Rabbi Babshada, a Persian Jew, uh, that Vilsker discovered his Sefer Hokma that Ferkovich had gathered from some grave in Egypt. In the preface to his book, Mishle Shel Sa'ad bin Babshad, Dr. Ezra Fleischer wrote that the Vilsker labors towards res rescuing these fragments are simply infinitely invaluable. Quote, I was looking for ways to see Ferkovich's manuscripts. Professor Sherman saw them but did not study them, and I had been waiting for 15 years. In Fleischer's book, that number over 300 pages, Fleischer constantly refers to, quote, the conclusions and findings of the genius, the Alui, Chaim Yefimovich, as invaluable. Fleischer refers to Vilsker as ha Ilui. Vilsker, this was actually told to me by um, uh, a student of Dr. Gita Gleskina, uh, Chaim Shanim, who I met in the AJL conference in Philadelphia when we were at Graz College. He was head of the Rare Books Room at the time. And he said, I'm a student of your, you know, grandmother's cousin, first cousin, Dr. Gita Gluskina. And by the way, she's married to a great scholar, Vilsker, who the, the Kohen Gadol of medieval Hebrew poetry called ha Louis. Yeah, that's oral tradition. Vilsker was known to some extent at the Leningrad State Public Library, named after Emmy Saltikov Shredrin, where Vilsker worked for 30 years, over 30 years, and of course was admired by other Hebraists and friends including Alex Tam, James Lieberman, Eliezer Rabinovich. Dr. Ezra Fleischer, expert in medieval Hebrew poetry and pioneer of the Hebrew poems in the Cairo Geniza, memorialized the following about Visker in Yidiot Achronot in March 13th of 1988. The passing of Leo Vilsker is a great loss. Our world mourns not just the important research of this incredible great man, an aristocrat of the scholarly spirit who was a messenger from an unfriendly country that persecuted him and Jewish scholarship. Leo Vilsker was a colleague with a generous and selfless soul. Many Israeli scientists have lost a friend who inspired us from afar, Petrograd, with his never tiring research and quest for understanding, with his fiery supreme creative passion, and who at the same time astounded us with his knowledge his understanding, his insights, and rare modesty. Fleischer had fought hard to bring Vilsker to serve in a joint appointment as professor and head librarian 
at the Widener Harvard Library. Dr. Isidore Tversky tried to bring Dr. Vilsker to the Harvard Widener Collection of Judaica with a joint appointment to lecture on the holdings of the Ferkovich Saltikov Library, but could not secure a visa for the scholar librarian. Shulamit Shalit writes of this connection with Harvard by noting, quote, When Ezra Fleischer was visiting the U.S. for his research for a whole year, he came to a brilliant idea to organize a trip for Vilsker to the United States. Finally, he would meet with the dear friend, if not in Israel, then in the United States on neutral ground. Chaim Efimovich was delighted with the official invitation from Harvard University to read lectures about the collection of Hebrew manuscripts in the Leningrad Public Library with a joint appointment as librarian and scholar to teach in the classroom. He decided to tempt the fate. He was redirected from one office in the USSR to another and then to another. He came, he wrote, he was refused. He continued coming again. Oh dear, naive Professor Fleischer, maybe it was not worth to start this fight, a fight with, with not the Don Quixotean windmills, but with the reinforced concrete Soviet mills and gulag. The scholarly journey, journal Kiryat Safer featured Vilsker's photo portrait with a long article by Professor Fleischer dedicated to Vilsker's discovery of unpublished poems of Rav Yehuda Halevi and Rav Halevi's friendship with Rabbi Moshe Ibn Ezra. The article had already been sent to print, but then came the unexpected and untimely passing of Chaim Vilsker suddenly in St. Petersburg. Fleischer made changes in the introduction and footnotes, and the editors accepted Fleischer's request to include a special page with a photo of Vilsker. The, this publishing of a photo in Kiryat Sefer was the first time in 62-year history of the journal, Kiryat Sefer, first published in 1926, that included a photo. In this photo, Vilsker is wearing a white sweater that he inherited from his scholar brother-in-law, Joseph Amusen, who married my maternal grandmother's cousin, Dr. Leia Gluskin. If you want to know people that had a really hard time in Russia publishing their research and doing Jewish research, you should read uh, Leia Gluskina's description of really the Mesirat Nefesh that her husband, Dr. Joseph Amusen, went through as a scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the former Soviet Union. Uh, because, I mean, he, it's amazing. He published uh, in many languages, over 10, in Hungarian, Polish, French, German, of course, Russian and Hebrew. Uh, and yet nobody really gave him a shtel, and he lived very poor. So this sweater that Vilsker is wearing, you know, was like the, the one article of of, uh, of any economic value in the family that Vilsker cherished uh, from his brother-in-law. And it kept him warm in the cold Soviet uh, winters, too. So um, uh, the untiming passing of Vilsker, Fleischer made changes in the introduction and included the photo in Kiryat Saper the first time. In this photo, Vilsker's wearing that white sweater of Joseph David Amison, um, who married Leia Gluskina, the sister of Vilsker's wife, Dr. Gita Gluskina. In the article by Dr. Fleischer's focus was upon the youthful years of Yehuda Levi and the beginning of his friendship with Rabbi Moses Ibn Ezra, a venerable poet. The subtitle reads, According to the Research of Chaim Vilsker. The article was already sent for printing when a message about the sudden death of Vilsker had arrived from Leningrad. Professor Fleischer hastened to make necessary changes in the introduction, main text, and notes. The present text had to be changed to the past tense. Fleischer insisted that for the first time in 62 years, the journal allocate a special page for Vilsker's photograph. What followed after Vilsker's passing was a tidal wave of popular articles and scholarly publications broadcasting the importance of Vilsker's research, however clandestinely smuggled out of Russia. So the following is a, an obituary in Soviet Heimland, Soviet Motherland, number 5, May 1988, translated um, by El Belov on July 6, 1988, uh, in Jerusalem, and reads in English the translation, In the beginning of the 70s, there were publications by a new author in a journal Soviet Heimland, called, pronounced Geimland. The readers were immediately captivated by the unusual character of this materials that were published generally under the rubric quote our announcements. It is impossible to recognize the wide dispersion, dispersion of the author's research by mentioning only some titles of his papers. Quote, 
New Materials for the History of Jews in Russia. Quote, Hymn to Wisdom by Rav Babshad. Chapter from an unknown book by a Persian Jew. The Unknown Selected Aphorisms by Philosophers. Quote, The History of Printing Among Jews. Three. Another one. The Source of Pushkiana Among Jews. Quote, Another one, the recently founded parable of Aesop, a Syrian version written in Jewish script. Another one, the unknown poems of Rabbi Yoda Levi. The author of these materials was Vilsker, a Leningrad researcher, candidate of philological sciences. Vilsker was born in 1919 in the small town of Shmusk in Ternopol region of Ukraine. From 40 until the World War II, he served in the Soviet Army. In 50, he completed his studies at the Department of Semitology and Hebraicis, of Leningrad University. For several years, he was in charge of the Department of Semitology at the Leningrad Public Library, named after uh, Saltykov Shredkin. In 1970, he had defended his dissertation, quote, Samaritan language, and received a degree of candidate in philological sciences. When this dissertation was published as a book in 1974, it was highly appreciated as an important study in Semitology as well as significant contribution to research in the history of Samaritans. By dedicating his life to the problems of ancient Hebrew literature, Vilsker chose an unbeaten path. Each of his works undoubtedly manifests a unique discovery. Amongst almost all of his research papers that were published in the journal Soviet Geimland have been reprinted in Jewish and Hebrew press abroad, particularly his works about Rav Yudha Levi. As a scientist, Vilsker accomplished a lot in a filed and deciphering the unknown ancient Jewish texts which are located in library archives of the Russia, which nobody but him was able to study with such competence and ability and attention to detail. In this field, his work has an extreme significance for the world culture. Several of Vilsko's works were left unfinished on his desk. A few days before he passed on, he had sent to the journal an article about the unknown letters of Chaim Nachman Bialik, which Vilsker had been working on during the last few months of his life. Soviet Geimland published two collections of Vilsker's works, which were added to the journal publications under the name Discovered Treasures, and which included only some of his confidence that there will be in the future no researchers of ancient Jewish literature who would be able to do without discoveries made by Vilsker. For the history of ancient Jewish literature, his discoveries have made an invaluable, infinite contribution. And this is from Soviet Geimland, uh, translated from Hebrew by, to Russian by El Belov, uh, July 6, 1988, in Jerusalem. Unfortunately, while Vilsker was alive, the importance of his research was relatively unknown, except after the publication of Kiryat Sefer in Israel, where he had never been able to get a visa out of Russia to go. Vilsker's scholarship was obscured due to the difficulties of publishing in Jewish-related subjects in Russia, where such research during Vilsker's lifetime was not only not a priority, but frowned upon. One could not even publish any letter in Hebrew alphabet. Vilsker was a relative unknown who faced discrimination in Russia against Jewish scholars in general, which trickled down to his workplace in Leningrad State Public Library. <clears throat> Shalit touches upon the great persecution of Jews in Soviet hegemony. She writes, In 62, Leningrad Vilsker visited a cousin of Dr. Gita Gluskina, an Israeli. Gita says, Vilsker went to greet her, on the street, and they met other people from the Israeli group. One of the KGB photographers photoed them, and for the communication with foreigners, the head of the library, Vilsker, uh, the, head, the head of the library, not Vilsker, a hefty anti-Semite made Vilsker to be removed from the department where he worked in the specialty of Oriental manuscripts and was transferred to the acquisitions department. The discomfort of surveillance under communists manifests itself throughout the Vilsker family as it did for many Soviet Jews. Dr. Gita Gluskina Vilsker told Shulamit Shalit, quote, At various times she and her husband were summoned by the authorities. He was asked to collect readers' conversations. What kind of readers? He asked in response, quote, But there are Jewish elders that visit your library. They dig in the Talmud and other religious texts. They converse. And then he, the official, added that Vilsker must keep his conversation secret. The KGB would persecute him if he let it be known. Vilsker replied, I have no secrets. He paused and added, You know everyone has his vocation, profession. You cannot do my job, and I cannot do yours. That's fright. That's really courage to stand up to a KGB like that. After Vilsker was not summoned anymore. As for Gita, this is a different story. Gita's sister Esther joined Hashomer Tzair, and she was sent to Siberia 
for her Zionist activities in sending money to Israel. Although Hashomer Atzir was a secular Zionist organization, in Russia there was no differentiation for a Zionist was a Zionist of any political stripe. Now, uh, the Baal Shem was arrested because he was sending, a uh, Baal Tanya rather, for sending funds to Eretz Yisrael. Um, that's a lecture unto itself. Uh, we're not going to have time to digress here. But um, I, I should mention Rabbi Menachem Mendel Gluskin and his father-in-law, Rabbi Eliezer Rabinovich, were arrested as well twice uh, and, and, and detained and made to sign a document that was false, that there's no religious persecution in Russia. Um, let, we're going to skip in the interest of time about to get to Vilsker. Five years later, after being transferred to acquisitions, a new head of the department of the Saltykov Library demanded to bring Vilsker back to the Oriental Studies collection. For without him, quote, the entire special collection became stripped. In 1979, Vilsker enjoyed a banquet in honor of his 60th anniversary. That evening, he heard a lot of good things. The next morning, he was asked to retire. That's awfully nasty. Vilsker was forced to continue only as a bookbinder. With extra time on his hands, Vilsker pro bonum plowed ahead with his Hebraico research in the Ferkovich collection. Abraham Ferkovich, a lover of antiquities, traveled extensively in different countries in the Middle East and built up this incredible collection. Um, and, you know, Vilsker would, would spend a, countless hours going through it. Scientists from different countries used to come to have a chance to just take a look at the collection. And now Vilsker decided to delve into them, being free from his regular job and only being a bookbinder. He directed all his energies to the study of Jewish texts of the collection. He was well-versed in different handwritings, fonts, and languages, he had a sharp eye for things that were left unnoticed by others, and his labor was bringing discoveries almost every day. He felt that he had found unknown poetry of the medieval Jewish poets, including those of Rav Yudha Levi, but he could not know for sure. When Vilsker would stumble on such a poem, he did not know whether it was known to the world or was it a discovery. It was risky to publicize, declare, and discovery of a poem, and it was premature to publish about it. What if the poem already had been published in a previous edition by Brody, for instance, or the Shadal? What would he do? He would write down the cached clandestine first line on a single line and send it in a letter, sometimes in Yiddish translation, to Ezra Fleischer in Israel. Vilsker knew that Professor Fleischer was the preeminent specialist in medieval Hebrew poetry. The venerable professor, extremely excited, would rush like a high-spirited young man to Heichal Shlomo, to dig for hours in a huge catalog containing records of all famous poems of medieval poets, and then send a response to Vilsker. No, nope, unpublished. And by this way, Vilsker discovers not one or two, but as many as over 22 completely unknown poems of Rav Yehuda Levi. He analyzes them and publishes his findings with great difficulties in Sovietish Heimland, that is, in a Yiddish journal, while feeling undisguised suspicion towards himself. Dr. Gita Gluskina, her, his wife, reminisces, Vilsker was not a poet, but he was forced to be one by the circumstances, to make translations into Yiddish of the words by the great Rav Yehuda Levi. The journal was terribly afraid of any word in Hebrew. They would not publish Hebrew, only Yiddish. As an honest researcher, Vilsker would supplant the translation with a photocopy of an original Hebrew poem. An editorial board footnote would say original photo was omitted because of lack of space, but it was the policy to censor Jewish scholarship. But there was an instance when either by mistake or because the superiors were not present, one fragment facsimile in Hebrew was accidentally printed in the journal, and the happy scientists in Israel, among them Ezra Fleischer, examined and studied every letter of it. What a story. So the first publication of Vilsker's research about the unknown poems of Yudah Levi uh, 1075 to 1141, appeared in February issue of Soviet Heimland Journal in 1982. Eight pages altogether. On April 7th, there was an announcement about the publication in Israeli newspaper Mariv. Among those who first responded to this terrific publication discovery were such connoisseurs of medieval poetry and literary historians and experts in Yiddish and Hebrew as Joseph Chaim Krunch and uh, Yehuda Ratshabi, Rach, David Yosefon, Dev Yardan, and Nehemia Aloni. The sensation literally rocked the whole scientific world. Newspapers were first to respond, and then the serious journals started responding. 
The precious treasures were not buried somewhere in the wilderness in the corner of the earth, not in a cave, but in one of the centers of the civilized world. Many rave responses and reviews reached the author, inspired by them. Vilsker directed his intelligence and passion of a pioneer on the continued search and analysis of his findings. A year later, he published a new and almost 20-page long article entitled 198 Poems of Rav Yehuda Levy, an Unknown Edition. This is how the term Vilsker List appeared in the scientific literature. For among the mentioned 198 first lines of the works of Yehuda Levy, about 111 were not mentioned in other indexes, including the classic catalog, catalog by Rabbi Shmuel David Lozado that had been studied by scientists for 150 years. Among the first who responded to the first and second publication of Vilsker in Soviet Hamland was a rabbi and scholar, Rabbi David Yosefan, who among other things was the editor of three volumes, the Book of Tanakh, Torah, uh, Nivim, and Ketuvim, in Russian translation, published by Masada Rav Cook in 78. Originally from Poland, David Yosefon knew Russian and Yiddish in many languages. Do Rabbi Yosefon wrote his second article for the newspaper Hatsofea on his deathbed. His relatives had sent the article to an editor along with his letter. Quote, I am writing these words in a hospital fortress, Hadassah, after a major surgery. It turned out that while walking on Jaffa Street, I fell and lost consciousness. And though I cannot yet get out of bed, I think that this is my duty and pleasure to tell you that the scientist researcher Vilsker, the scholar of Leningrad, has made a new discovery, and he had written about it in Sovietish Heimland. I want and I must ask for the attention of all Jewish researchers towards the fact of the immense scholarly impact of Vilsker's findings. Last letter, the words of greeting from one scientist to another across the Iron Curtain. Of course, they, Vilsker and Yosefan, were not acquaintances. Later on, others with reference to this article by Dr. Yosefan write, It is intelligent, insightful, and full of light and love. In a similar way, while descending also as a Gozas, in 1983, Professor Dr. Nechemia Aloni had blessed Vilsker in his labors. That was a reaction to the first article by Vilsker. Professor Aloni wrote in the journal Sinai, number 93, quote, we are waiting with great hope and impatience. A continuation of his, Vilsker's work, in all its brilliance and depth. We learn from his concise article more than wicked, winded volumes and other valuable authors. After enumerating orderly the seven discoveries of Vilsker so far in, in, in articles, while giving them a clear scientific analysis, Aloni adds, and quote, the most important discovery is the author himself, Vilsker, who until yesterday was not listed among the research Jewish scholars in the works of Rav Yehuda Levi, but who had become the foremost one from today on. Nechomi Aloni named the poem of Rav Yehuda Levi about a pogrom in Toledo in the 12th century, the fourth discovery in the first article by Vilsker. So, um... This is an amazing poem. It's, it begins, Accept a beseeching soul saturated with sadness and suffering, and subside from your anger, for Jacob shall rise, shall be heard in your ears the strong expressions of words of your multitudes, that is called your folk. The voice is that of Jacob. We know that from time to time we have sinned and hurt many in the sin of Jacob, and today we are comforted, and we wish the path of consolation with a great hope that the one above will have a mercy upon the remnants of the Jacobites, an expression of the comfort for the broken heart, and give composition and mercy to the house of Jacob. Uh, remove sadness from the mind and expedite the Messiah with all the possibility of Hashem. Uh, the fifth discovery, according to Loni, is a song of love, Yonim Yiranenu. Here is a brief story. When this song was not yet known in Israel, Vilsker's friend in Petrograd, the composer Hirsch Paikin, created music for the poem, whereas his wife Clara Yaakovlevna Levna performed the song. At that time, they both started learning Hebrew with Vilsker, secretly. 
Inspired by the work of the scientist Vilsker, Pekin wrote a lot of music for the poems of Rav Yehuda Levi and even composed an opera about Rav Yehuda Levi. They performed this repertoire on many occasions in Israel, but the Pekins um, are not anymore. Clara Yakolevna made a cassette recording of their songs whose words are Yonim Yaron Kakamoni Chem Albain Makshav Zaku Mehu Homim Al Yamim Halhu Bli Hamda Uzaman Perud Kalaf Ki Bemehu it translated here performers repeat the first two lines as the chorus the as core dodi dodi yonati kialof besamehem alai the translation is doves are cooing and i am like them here here is the watering and the waters are pure and they murmur like a sea of pure water joyless is my wandering it's time to part doves are coo cooing I remember my little dove and the scent of her breasts. So this is a poem by Ravi Lady, Yehuda Levi, not known before. A great scientific discovery gives impetus to the entire Jewish research field and entails an avalanche of new investigations and publications. Vilsker managed to publish three more articles, a total of five, that there was already written a sixth paper that came out after his death. And Professor Yachalom writes, in the last article, Vilsker presents for the first time the entirely message of Halevi to his great patron of Granada, the poet Moshe Ibn Ezra. But in Yiddish, the text of the Hebrew original and of this important manuscript was prohibited for printing, and the death of Vilsker had closed the last window through which we looked furtively, almost like thieves, into the world of Hebrew manuscripts in Leningrad, which was unknown and prevented from our travel to consult it. I hear in these words both anger and bitterness. Don't we completely agree with them? While pondering over the fate of such scholars trapped in communist Russia and heroes such as Vilsker, Joseph Amusin, and many others, once the Iron Curtain fell, the notable Yosef Yachalom hurried to Leningrad. He then told about the trip and about how he was getting acquainted with Vilsker's treasure in Peyamim Journal, number 46 to 7, 1991. So, I'm going to conclude now in the interest of time. We've looked at five scholar Jewish librarians, uh, namely Steinschneider, Marx, Kasudo, Sholem, and my relative through marriage, Vilsker, who were scholars first, but saw their research as working in tandem with their being librarians and bibliographers. Today, the fusion of librarians who are both technologists and bureaucrats, let us call it technocracy, is making the inspiring model of the scholar librarian on par with rare species such as the horned owl in environmental terms. Without such librarian models of scholarly excellence like the five I mentioned, not only will librarianship be less for it, but if you read my paper in the proceedings, um, librarianship by neglecting the importance of Jewish scholarship as something not separate from librarianship, but essential to its continuity is digging its own grave and will be fatal to the profession of Judaica librarianship. So I'm going to close <coughs> this uh, lecture with the words of Stephen Reif, who sent me uh, his speech that he had somebody else deliver for him in Cleveland at the AJL conference. So Reif sent me the following. He had somebody else read this for him because uh, due to an illness and family, he couldn't go to attend Cleveland AJL, where I presented a paper on the Dead Sea Scrolls Library. So, Reef writes, Once upon a time, dear colleagues, it was not unusual, it was perhaps even perfectly regular, for those with responsibilities for great libraries or outstanding collections of books to function all at once as librarians, bibliophiles, bibliographers, researchers, scholars, and managers. What is more, some of the greatest names in the history of modern Jewish scholarship, including Steinschatter, Abraham Berliner, Adolf Neubauer, Marx, Gershom Scholem, played such a role and roles, not so much because they were imposed upon them, but rather in response to what book learning meant to them as a mission. Alas, at some point in the more recent decades, libraries and educational institutions of which they are a part have taken to splitting such functions in specialization, 
and assigning each of them to a different post, while at the same time adding additional breeds of librarians whose sole function is technology or fundraising. When seen in the broader bi bi bibliographical context, this may or may not be a favorable development. What is beyond question is that it has led to a most unfavorable suspicion of any member of the profession who attempts to be a kind of factotum that was once the norm. Those are very profound words by Stefan Reif. Um, and I recall Steinscheider's remark, which he did not say, but was misattributed to him um, in Necrology. Wir haben nur noch die Aufgabe, die Überrest des Judentum uh, Jewish scholars who are librarians, however rare they be today, and I consider myself sitting at the feet of these great scholar librarians and listening to their monologues and admiring their scholarship. I'm a nothing. The goal is not so much to give, quote, the, the misassigned decent burial to Jewish culture and life and vitality across the millennia, but rather to let contributions made by these scholar librarians not be forgotten as the best notes, the zikronot yesh and to warn about the risks today in librarianship that does not cherish, revere, and celebrate the model of a scholarly librarian as it once did, as we see in the models of the five. So, um, Reef notes that the specialization that is the nature of technocracy, or what continental philosophy calls Verlassenheit, uh, is a great sadness. Yet the Schicksal Landgeitis Langsbrache dictates that if we abandon the model of scholarly Judaica librarian, this will be suicide for Judaica librarianship. Um, and so uh, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the scholar librarians, Steinschneider, Marx, Kosudo, Sholem, and Vilsker. And we left so many of them out. Uh, we should have included Stefan Reif, Menachem Schmelzer, Jacob Dienstag, Dr. Malachi Beit Ari. Um, but as one English poet, Mar uh, I think his name was Andrew Marvel, said, a Dickensian universe, his last name is Marvel, uh, says, if we had but time and worlds, plural, worlds, enough which um, is telling because we must bring this lecture to a close in the interest of time and may we only hope that the future will enable scholars that can pioneer research as did the great librarian Steinschneider, Marx, Casuto, Scholem, and Vilsker. If you're interested in more detail about Dr. Vilsker, please see this book, Gluskin Family History. Thank you very much.